I started the recording, Christina, on mine. Okay. I don't know why it's not letting me click. There we go. I'll start it for you. I'm sorry. That's all Thank right. you. I, I don't know why it wasn't letting you because I'm listed as the co host. You're the host. Okay. We've opened the webinar. We can go ahead and get started. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to call to order this meeting of the Texas State Board of Examiners of Professional Counselors Rules Committee. Today is Thursday, April 8th, 2021 at 102 p.m. I am Chair Stephen Hallbauer, public member. Chris? Dr. Christopher Taylor, Vice Chair. Janie? Uh, Janie Stubblefield, professional member. And Garrett? Garrett Nearin, public member. We are the four board members that comprise the Rules Committee. Christina, if you'll introduce staff, please. Sure. Um, myself, uh, Christina DeLuna, board administrator. Um, we have our two board attorneys, uh, Rayanne Elong and Mary Sicola. Uh, we also have Patrick Hyde, our general counsel, uh, Timothy Spear, the operations manager, Brenda Skiff, our executive assistant, and Daryl Spinks, the executive director. Thanks everybody for joining us this afternoon. Um, do we want to introduce guests or just go ahead and move into discussion? Uh, I say we get started. <laughs> okay. I'd like to welcome all of our participants joining us today. Um, I want to uh, go ahead and sort of uh, set some uh, parameters for uh, the meeting today. The objective Today is to have a productive discussion. We are, um, we are tackling what is a pretty significant proposed rule change. Um, this is an open meeting. We have invited stakeholders to participate. Uh, we have solicited written comment um, from everyone. And those that have uh, not submitted a written comment will have the opportunity to speak briefly in a, um, in, and public comment uh, following our stakeholder comments. Um, I, the, like I said, the objective of today is to have a productive discussion. And if, um, if, that, if we can come out of this meeting saying that we achieved that, then uh, that's an accomplishment. Um, we are all adults, we're professionals. I, I anticipate this will be uh, respectful, but um, there's room for disagreement today, and I understand that. Um, but very clearly, we want to hear from our stakeholders. Very clearly, we want to hear from our mental health professionals. Um, if it's possible, uh, Rules Committee members, uh, it would be nice to come out of this meeting with a recommendation that we can take to the full board, um, whether that is a, an endorsement or a decline or certain stipulations. Uh, if that's the if that's the result we come can come out of here today, then uh, that would be extraordinary. Uh, however, if the worst we do today is we have a lively and respectful and beneficial discussion, then we will have a, we'll use this time wisely and effectively. Um, I would like to kind of frame the discussion today. Um, I think it's I don't think it's in dispute that we have a, a, a shortage of mental health professionals in this state. Um, that's even more pronounced now, um, one year into COVID, and with more people moving to the state every day, we, we are at a, a shortage of mental health professionals. I've heard it described as a crisis, uh, and, and I, I've, I've never disputed that. Um, we do not I don't think there's room for debate that we do need good therapists in the state and we need more of them. Uh, it's, especially, it's especially important in our underserved populations, uh, rural Texans, uh, citizens of color, the economically disadvantaged um, and the elderly. Uh, uh, that's, it's an even bigger issue in those areas. Rule changes that increase access and availability of mental health professionals to the entire state, but especially to those underserved demographics, 
uh, we, we welcome rule changes that free up availability and we get more good therapists out there. Um, that's, a, that's especially important. And it's especially important for our underserved communities. That being said, this me personally, uh, this board, um, BHEC, uh, we cannot allow, we cannot permit, we cannot endorse rule changes that increase uh, the risk to the public. And so we do have a, we do have balancing to do here. Um, rule changes that we can make that increase availability, that increase access, we're all for it, but it has to be balanced with an assessment of the, a determination of the increased risk, if there is one, it has to be balanced with the risk that the rule change presents to the public. And, th and that is our job today. And stakeholders, when we hear from you, uh, public members who wish to comment when we hear from you, that's the framework for this discussion today. And it's the framework that we will take uh, to consideration for the full board. Um, we, we are, I think we all are looking to, to make changes or um, look for ways that uh, we can um, be better for the citizens of Texas, where we can uh, make this profession better. Um, yes, we are tasked with protecting the public. Uh, my personal philosophy is part of protecting the public is making sure the public has access to great therapists. So these are the considerations that we're balancing today. And when you do present your, um, your uh, oral statements today, keep that in mind that this is how the board is going to evaluate this decision. Really, this is what the board uh, considers with every decision that we make. So thank you for everybody that's here today. Uh, I think we're gonna have a pretty, probably a record uh, participation for a rules committee meeting. And uh, I, I understand why, and, and we welcome it. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, the way that we have set up this process is that we invited our stakeholder organizations, um, TCA, TASIS, Christian Counseling, and LPC Associates. We invited each of them to submit a written comment on the proposed rule change and uh, that we would allot them five minutes to make um, an oral presentation during today's meeting. So we're gonna go ahead and move forward with that portion. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and ask Dr. Allen if she's here, if she wants to go ahead and present the LPC Associates uh, comments on the proposed rule change. They've been the ones that have sort of uh, driven this process so far. Uh, we'll give them the opportunity to speak first. Hello, I'm here and I'm happy to be here. Thanks, Dr. Allen. Welcome. Thanks. So uh, first, thank you all for your attention to this matter. Uh, I think it's no secret that I am pretty passionate about it. Um, and I believe that our organizational position is pretty clear. Um, our statement on the matter has not really shifted much since our last meeting. Um, I'm gonna to try to be pretty quick here. I've been told by one or two people that I can be long-winded. So I will practice uh, reducing that today. Uh, all right, so the first thing I would like to take a moment just to clarify a couple of things. Since the last meeting, it's been brought to my attention uh, that there's some misunderstanding about what our organization believes. And so I want to go on record and make it very clear that our organization does not in any way advocate for associates not being supervised. I don't know where that came from. That is not something that we believe. Uh, in addition to that, we do not in any capacity advocate for prohibiting LPC supervisors from charging for supervision. We, um, it's my belief that our uh, graduate programs might be able to do a little bit of a better job educating students on the importance of the supervisory relationship and that it is a service um, and so our organization works to kind of 
fill that gap by educating our members on um, the fact that this is not a free thing that should be happening. And so in no way, again, do we advocate for um, LPC supervisors across our state uh, not charging for their supervision services. Um, all right, I'd like to speak to just a couple of points. The first one, um, while we do appreciate your attention to whether or not associates can take direct payment, I think it's important that we note uh, allowing associates to take direct payment without allowing them to own and operate a private practice may be a moot point. Uh, if they're not able to uh, file a PLLC or an LLC as a business owner, then they're not able to get a business bank account. And so where those payments would go, I'm not entirely sure. I do think that it might uh, bring about some significant tax implications and additional liability for the associate taking payment without having a business entity. Um, this one is the next point here. I'm not entirely sure. I'm sure there's somebody out there with way more experience on this than myself. Uh, however, um, we think that perhaps rules prohibiting any Texas resident, including LPC associates, from accepting a payment or owning a business in this state may be outside of the regulatory authority of the board. I would ask that either the counseling board or BHEC that someone looks into that. I can't speak much more on the matter other than for me, it's a little unclear uh, whether or not the board does have that authority. So now I'll speed things up a little bit. At our last meeting, we did discuss um, concerns around the exam differences for MFT associates and LPC associates. And so in between our meetings, I spent some time collecting uh, comprehensive data of state board rules and regulations across the country. What we found was 17 states do in fact allow LPC associate or the equivalent of to own and operate a private practice. Of those 17 states, only 10 require an exam to grant the LPC associate license. That exam is not the NCMHCE. That was a big point of concern at our last meeting. Uh, so I would like to point out that that is not the standard across the country for states that do allow their associates to own and operate a private practice. In terms of the liability concern, our organization fully supports shared liability across the LPC associate and LPC supervisor, much like our uh, LMFT colleagues have adopted or put into their rules. Um, this is really important to us. And I think probably um, the thing that we want to make the most clear, uh, if LPC associates are allowed to own and operate a private practice, the LPC supervisor maintains the ability to approve or deny a site. If the LPC supervisor does not believe that an associate is competent or ready to own or operate a private practice, they don't have to supervise that associate. Uh, this is not a mandate. This is not a requirement. This is an option. Um, in addition to that, we have 4,560 associates in Texas. We have 5,319 supervisors. I do not believe in any capacity that 4,500 associates will open a private practice the day that they may, may be allowed to do so. As many people here know, that is quite the process. Um, I also don't know that all 5,300 people uh, that are supervisors in our state would just abandon supervision altogether. They would merely refuse to supervise an LPC associate owning and operating a private practice. That right and that autonomy, we are not suggesting that that is removed from supervisors in any capacity. Uh, just a couple more points here. Um, I would like to point out that there are no rules requiring supervisors to maintain contact with current sites. Um, in fact, we know that uh, often associates are given conflicting direction or guidance from the LPC supervisor and whomever is supervising them at the agency or their place of employment. Um, to that point, um, due to the rule being removed about face-to-face -face supervision. Uh, currently in the state of Texas, 
100% of all supervision can be conducted online. The supervisor is not required to be on site. Even further, we could have someone in Brownsville supervising an associate in Dallas. They are not waiting around the corner. They are not at the end of the day sitting and staffing necessarily in person. They are merely a phone call away, an email away, Zoom or supervision session away. An associate owning and operating their private practice should still have that level of accessibility hundreds of miles across the state, which is currently allowed per our board rules. Uh, in closing, I would like to reiterate again, because I do not want this to be confused by our rules committee or any member of the public or supervisor that is listening. We want LPC supervisors to reserve the right to approve or deny a site. This means that they could deny an associate with a site that is their own private practice. This is not about mandating supervisors, telling them who they have to supervise in what settings. This does not change this. It's merely asking for parity, opportunity, and choice for both the associate and supervisor. And so again, I would like to thank you, uh, the Rules Committee, for holding this public meeting. And finally, LPC supervisors and the state that are collaborating with us, that are supportive, and that also believe in uh, the <clears throat> advocacy efforts that we've engaged in. Thank you, Dr. Allen. Um, if you would um, please be so kind, um, stick around here on the Zoom. Um, we um, are likely gonna have questions for you as we begin our discussion. Thank you for your presentation. And, um, and thank you for the, the, uh, the comments that you, that you solicited and that you summarized. Um, I, I, personally, I read through each and every one of them. Uh, I, I, I thank you for uh, doing the work on that uh, to get that information to us. At this point, we're going to go ahead and move forward with Christian Counselors of Texas. I believe it's going to be uh, Sandra Martin, if she's available. Yes, I'm here. Hi, Ms. Martin. Uh, for hi. Us. Uh, we have um, five minutes to mm -hmm. present uh, your oral presentation on um, the Christian Counselors of Texas uh, response to the proposed rule change. All right. I did submit a written um, response, written comments in regards to the subjects, especially in particular the two subjects on the, on the table for today. I wanted to make these comments more on a personal note. Um, I came into uh, licensed professional counselor status after 30 years or more in full-time ministry. About 17 of those years included pastoral counseling, not your kind that you would expect to be. I counseled a dissociative identity disorder was my baptism of fire. Uh, I did depression, I did drug addicts, I did bipolar, I did the whole range that you would not expect pastoral counselors to do. I didn't choose that, it chose me. Um, so I came inexperienced into an internship, which is humbling to say the least. But when I came in and did my internship in just under two years, I found that I was incredibly, and it sounds like I'm not gonna hit the billing, but I am. I was incredibly and deeply grateful for the covering that I had in my supervisor, full liability, full responsibility for me. It was um, very comforting and very relieving. Now this is after 17 years of counseling deep issues. It's a different world out there with professional counseling than with pastoral counseling. It's not near as friendly and you can make lots of mistakes. In fact, just recently I asked our executive director here, is there any other mistake I can make? And he said, oh, there are probably hundreds of thousands. We just haven't discovered them yet. So that is one thing is that personal testimony. Um, but I also wanted to touch on the supervisory issue um, for this reason. It's not a matter of whether supervisors are mandated or free to take or anything else, but I've talked to many supervisors on these issues. 
the supervisors are LPC supervisors are fully responsible in their understanding and mine for the people that they uh, supervise. They are not certainly not going to want to be attached in any way to their business or financial dealings that they've clearly expressed. But most of the ones I have spoken to have said, I will not want to supervise someone who does not understand what it takes to start a new business, what it takes to launch a new career in counseling, how many errors you can make, how many people you can alienate <laughs> and cause problems with. I just won't want to supervise. So I don't think it's, I'm, I'm not at all deceived by thinking that, that, that supervision would be mandated, but I do know that if the rules are passed, these associates will find a very, very, very hard time finding someone to supervise them. And I don't think they fully appreciate the value of having someone who stands with them. It, I never had a formal complaint issued against me, but if I had a formal complaint against me, I certainly would understand the value of having my supervisor standing there with me, not pushing it off on me or saying, well, she shouldn't have done this, but standing there beside me, taking full responsibility for the work that she did with me and I will be a supervisor, I'm, at least I'll be eligible soon. And I must admit, I would have second thoughts about that as well because my license would be at stake. I've worked hard for it. It's been a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. It has explored my horizons. I don't want my license endangered. I don't want my income endangered, although God supplies liberally beyond my license. I'm just, I would just hesitate as the other super, supervisors have told me, they would hesitate to take on an associate who is going to make numbers of mistakes. And some of them, some of them may even be career changing. So I'm just a little bit about a minute and a half short. So I'll turn that over. And I thank you very much for both the opportunity to write some comments, less personal, and to include some a little more personal. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Martin. Um, like I said with Dr. Allen, uh, please stick around if you have the time uh, sure. in case uh, we have questions for you or I have some uh, uh, specific items that we want to ask you about. Um, uh, Tasis did not submit a written comment, but um, I, I did want to ask if they did want to make... Um, uh, oh, we do have Mario. Okay, Mario, you do wish to make uh, comments today, don't you? Correct. Okay, well, thank you for joining us. You have five minutes and go ahead and get started. All right. Good afternoon, board members. Uh, Mario De La Garza, the liaison to the LPC board for the Texas Association for Counselor Education and Supervision. Thank you for the opportunity to provide public comment on behalf of TASIS. TASIS supports the idea of parity for LPC associates with other mental health professionals. Our membership supports efforts to help LPC associates earn a living wage in line with their level of education and training. We recognize that individuals who began their counselor education programs after 2017 who seek licensure as professional counselors in Texas are required to complete a 60 hour master's program. We believe this training prepares them for clinical work. At the same time, the educational requirements requirements may also leave new professionals with a large amount of student debt. Because of their training and because of the rules that this board has put in place, a majority of TASIS members feel confident that LPC associates should be able to take direct payments from clients. You may consider that allowing this process might provide easier access to mental health services for the Texas general public. Also, allowing LPC associates to take direct payments might alleviate struggles that many LPC supervisors and practice owners experience as they try their best to pay LPC associates fairly and classify them correctly under Texas Workforce Commission rules. However, TASIS believes it is important that the general public continues to be made aware that LPC associates are still under supervision and not fully licensed as independent practitioners. If the LPC board allows LPC associates to take direct payments, we ask that you consider adding rules requiring clear information on all billing documents that communicate to clients that LPC associates are being supervised. 
In hearing from members of our association, some members supported LPC associates owning independent private practices and other members did not. Members who did not support the rule change related their concerns about the responsibility and liability that supervisors hold when it comes to LPC associates under their supervision. Supervisors voiced their hesitancy and unwillingness to take on such responsibility and liability for a supervisee's private practice. Therefore, if the LPC board decides to allow LPC associates to own a private practice, we recommend that specific rules be adopted to protect LPC supervisors that limit the LPC supervisors liability to professional clinical practices only in which LPC associates engage. We recommend formulating rules that specifically state that LPC supervisors are not liable for practices in regards to the owned business. Our members voice concerns that the general public is also likely to think that someone who owns a private practice is fully licensed. If the LPC board adopts a rule allowing LPC associates to do this, please consider formulating rules that clearly specify that LPC associates who own these businesses must make it undoubtedly clear that they are practicing under supervision and are not practicing independently. One final consideration that was brought up by counselor educators was that an individual from a non-KCREP accredited program only has to meet the statutory requirement of 300 hours of practicum slash internship, and only 100 hours of those have to be direct client contact, to be granted an LPC associate license. Some supervisors and counselor educators noted that they wanted to see increased hour requirements for licensure and statute. They said if this were the case, they would be more apt to support LPC associates owning a private practice. We realize that the LPC board cannot currently change that requirement based on state law. However, should the LPC board decide it wants to look at clinical hours required for licensure, we are cautiously optimistic that House Bill 3626 will give the LPC board authority to raise the practicum slash internship hour requirement if the board thinks that will help to better prepare all counselors in training to provide clinical services to the Texas public. TASES recognizes that LPC supervisors ultimately get to make the decision whether or not to supervise LPC associates. Increased liability for supervisors seems to be the issue causing most supervisors to oppose allowing LPC associates to own a private practice. Please consider this so as to avoid a possible unintended consequence of a decreased number of supervisors willing to supervise LPC associates. TASIS thanks the board for its work in helping LPC associates secure fair compensation and recognition as professionals. I appreciate the opportunity to voice these thoughts from our membership. Thank you. Thank you, Mario. Dr. You, Taylor, Mario. Did you have something? Yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mario, can you give me a firm uh, yes for or against on this? We believe that they can, uh, TASIS, is most of our members, right, believe that uh, that they should take direct uh, payment. Our membership was um, split on whether they should own private practices. And again, like like I voiced, I, I wanted to give voice to both of those. Um, I appreciate that. Can you can you define most for me in a percentage ratio? We don't have uh, hard data for that, Doctor Doctor oh. Taylor. This is just uh, uh, supplemental data from like conversations in listserv. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Mario. Please stick around if you can. And our, our final stakeholder for, uh, uh, for oral comments today uh, is TCA, and I believe it's gonna be Jan. Hi, Jan. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, actually, can we? actually, Catherine Bacon is going to be, as the TCA board liaison, she'll be speaking. But hi. Go ahead. Uh, Catherine, you have, um, or Dr. Bacon, my apologies, it, you have five minutes for your comments. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, board, and thank you for this opportunity again to speak to you today and represent the Texas Counseling Association. I am Dr. Catherine Bacon, your volunteer appointed liaison. 
TCA's mission is to lead, educate, and advocate for the advancement of the counseling profession, to increase access to professional counselors and promote wellness. In the spirit of that mission, we are excited to share, in addition to what Dr. De La Garza and Tase has stated, that there has been progress made on House Bill 3626 that would create a technical correction to change temporary license to associate license to align with actual practice. We think this will further strengthen the issues before you today. TCA supports LPC associates being able to accept direct payment from clients. LPC associates level of training qualifies them to do that. We do hope that if the rules committee moves forward with rule changes regarding this issue, that they also consider the board putting out guidance so that when questions come up between associates, supervisors, and the board's charge to protect the public, that guidance can provide clarity on regulations, boundaries, liabilities, and expectations. This is a common practice when regulations are established the oversight agency for a particular constituency group that's being regulated, in this case, counselors. The agency provides guidance on how the statute and regulations will look like in actual implementation and what compliance with those regulations looks like. For example, if the committee and board decide that LPC associates will be allowed to accept direct payments from clients, but not operate as an independent practitioner, then provide guidance on where the boundaries are of those things. For example, if an associate can accept direct payments from a client, but cannot practice independently, then how does the associate then demonstrate that they are in compliance with those regulations? How does the supervisor monitor and observe there's compliance and the public is protected? So for example, maybe a billing statement that the client receives when they provide direct payment to the associate not only has the name of the business the LPC associate owns, the name of the associate, but also language on the billing statement that clearly communicates to the client giving that payment directly to that associate, that they're not operating independently, that they are not authorized to practice independently, and that they are being supervised and practicing under someone else's license. That would be one form of guidance. Another form of guidance would include if the board decides to allow LPC associates to accept direct payment from clients, but not practice independently, and then allows for shared responsibility with the LPC supervisor, therefore adjusting the supervisor's level of liability from the current, which states that the supervisor is fully responsible. So if the board decides to adjust the supervisor's level of responsibility, then where do the boundaries of that liability lie? So the guidance might state that if an LPC associate has a complaint filed against them related to billing, the LPC supervisor is not responsible for that violation if a violation is determined to have occurred. The supervisor's liability does not include any complaints or violations related to business practices and is exempted from any such liability. Thank you for the opportunity to share the perspectives of our members. We really sincerely appreciate the Rules Committee opening this meeting to stakeholders, and we thank the board for its commitment to protect the public. Thank you, Dr. Bacon. My pleasure. Dr. Taylor, do you have a question? Yes, please. Uh, Dr. Bacon, I uh, appreciate your comments. Um, I read through them all uh, as well. Um, uh, I'm not seeing a firm yes or no here. Can you, can you give me a firm for or against on this? Yes, we did submit written comment. Uh, thank you for, uh, for reading that. TCA supports LPC associates billing able, being able to you know, bill and receive payments directly from clients. Um, we are, however, requesting that the board provide guidance should you decide to do that on where the liabilities for the supervisor where the boundaries sure. of those liabilities lie. Yeah, and absolutely. I mean, there, there's, assuming that this moves forward, there, there would be a great deal of, of work needed to be done. But but that that part aside, are you saying you are for this, assuming that that these issues are addressed? Yes, sir. That is, that is TCA's position that they are for uh, as long as these items are addressed? 
Yes, TCA's position is that we support LPC associates billing, being able to bill and accept payment directly from clients, but that the boundaries surrounding liability of, you know, owning, you know, a business, for example, you know, be made very clear right. so that supervisors right. could know what that, where those boundaries of those liabilities lie. And so could the associates and so could the public. So, so safe to say four with conditions. Okay. Yes, sir. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Just Smith. guidance. Okay. Thank you. Thank you to our stakeholders. I, I, again, uh, I'd ask that you, if you have the time, please uh, stick around. Uh, at this time, we are going to open up this meeting to public comment. Um, my, uh, my request of you though, is there are over 130 people on this Zoom and um, if you have already submitted, submitted a comment, either through your stakeholder organization or directly to BHEC, um, please refrain from repeating that same comment here today because that will be uh, eating into our valuable discussion time. Uh, I'm gonna limit these public comments to one minute. Um, and I do ask uh, that your comment be, the way we can get the most uh, benefit out of the public comment is if, if you tell us whether you are for or against the rule change, that's fine. Uh, but we really get the most benefit when you explain your reasoning for why you are before it or against it. And um, if, uh, if uh, someone ahead of you has already said the point that you would like to say, it's not going to help us to just hear the, the same point again. So I would ask that you um, just defer if someone else has already made the point that you would like to make. Um, we want to hear from we want to hear from our therapists. That that is important. That is the goal of the meeting today. However, we are limited in the amount of discussion time that we have today, and so we are. Uh, please understand, we are trying to strike a balance to hearing from the public, but also allowing uh, plenty of discussion time following this public comment uh, time that we're going to set aside. Yeah, Patrick, if you'd be willing to, to keep time, uh, like I said, we're going to limit it to uh, quick comments, uh, one minute in length. Chair, Chair Hobart? Yes, sir. I, I had one question for Dr. Bacon. Would you like me to hold that or may I ask it now? Go ahead. Dr. Bacon, I'm fixing to bring you back up, or I see, I noticed in your statements, you were very careful in your response to Dr. Taylor, and you mentioned that you were supportive of the issue of direct payment, but you didn't mention anything about ownership of the business. I want you, I want to hear what your answer is on ownership of the business. Thank you, sir. TCA is not currently endorsing owning a business. We think that that can create some confusion similar to I think what some of um, the other people who've commented have, have raised that owning a business might create confusion um, as well as I think what Dr. something Dr. Allen touched on, which is um, how the ownership of a business and, and the, the, the complicated nuance of that and how the client would pay that business. And there, you know, just, so that's our position right now in terms of of owning a business, we, we are not currently endorsing the ownership just because of the confusion that that might create to the public. And you opposed to it? We're not necessarily saying that we're opposed to it at this point. We're just not currently endorsing it at this point. Okay. But we do appreciate that you guys are thinking about those things. We are as well. Well, Dr. Bacon, what would you need to see from us in order to uh, sway your opinion one direction or the other? That guidance that, that we're talking about, um, if there could be some really clear guidance on um, how that, how compliance with these pieces would look. So if, um, if owning a business is, is what you guys decide to allow, then provide guidance on how doing that and the operations of that would not then violate would not then violate other rules for example or would not then you know create viability for a supervisor for example um, that that would be what we would what we would hope to see is is really clear guidance on 
the parameters and boundaries of, of all of those parts. Does, does that make sense? It does. I think that's going to be a major component to our discussion today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bacon. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I may real quick. Yes, please. Uh, just before we go into public comment, I just wanted to make it very clear to everybody. I, I, I have read, and I know, I know our chair has read, and I'm, I'm, I'm quite certain our other board members have read as well, all, I don't know, seven, 800 plus comments that were sent in. I, I am very grateful for each and every one of them. Thank you. Uh, read them all in detail, some of them several times. Uh, uh, we really appreciate those. Uh, if everybody chooses to speak today for three minutes, uh, and I'm not, I'm not trying to discourage anybody from doing it, but we'll be here for five hours. So what's that? Or one minute? Yeah, still be here for three hours. Uh, so I'm very happy to hear from everybody. I just want to be very clear that that if you have submitted written comment, it has been read and heard. Uh, so I just wanted to make that clear for anybody that might be here uh, as well. I will echo echo those statements. Um, we've had issues in the past where uh, written comments have been uh, submitted, um, but. For me personally, I gave more time and attention to the written comments on this issue than I have any issue up until this point. Not that I've discounted past issues. However, I recognize that there was a certain weight associated with, with these comments. And I, I know Dr. Taylor put in uh, his time to read each and every one of them. Um, Garrett and Janie um, are, are incredible members of this committee and I know that they will have put in the preparation work as well. We are going to allow public comment at this time, but please understand that uh, the, that uh, we need beneficial statements, maybe an angle or a suggestion that has not been offered. Um, and if you did not have the opportunity to make a written comment, um, please uh, give us as much time as possible this afternoon to discuss this issue while we have everybody here. And at this time, we'll go ahead and get started. You have one minute. Uh, Patrick is gonna keep track of your time. He will give you a 15 second warning when your time is up. Okay. So Christina, um, go ahead with uh, the comments. Okay, so if you are interested in um, providing your comment, go ahead and raise your hand in the uh, Zoom features. Uh, the first person we're going to hear from right now is going to be Rhonda Kimball. Hi, everyone. Okay, very quickly. I think their confusion as an LPC associate comes from the issue of 1099, receiving a 1099 independent contractor versus being independently, professionally, um, having your own business. That's the confusion. W-2, 1099. 1099's independent contractor, not independently owned. We do pay for our own advertising. We do kind of own our own business. And I think um, supervision should have a cap on the amount that they're allowed to charge because we're required to have it. Each associate should carry their own liability insurance. And I do. So, um, and everything that our name is printed on, our supervisor's name is printed on. That's part of the rules already. So we do not walk around and um, advertise ourselves as individuals or independent. But remember, the language of independent contractor is a big issue for associates. It's very confusing. So independent ownership, independent contractor, 1099 tax forms, two different issues. Very confusing. One minute. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kimball. Thank you, Ms. Okay, Kimball. may I comment, Dr. Uh, Chair Habar? Yes. Uh, the question here is not the W-2-1099 debate. The What's on in discussion here is uh, for LPC associates to own and operate a private practice and take direct billing from clients. Correct. Just to clarify for everybody on the call, we're not in the debate between a W-2 and a 1099. That, that's a... It's a whole other agency, <laughs> right. yeah, way sorry. above my pay grade. Yeah, thank you, Jane. Hey, Daryl, is it possible? Uh, I mean, besides anything, any outside of anything we do here today, can we put the IRS and the TWC's 1099 test on our website? Can we just like hyperlink to that and say, this? If you can pass these ten questions, you can be a 1099. Can we just put that on our website? We could. The question is, is anybody going to read it? 
<laughs> um, just from a practical standpoint. Same thing I tell standpoint. my staff. Exactly what I tell my staff. Thank you. Yeah. Chair Halbar, I would also, can we ask that as individuals come on, they um, state their name and their current licensure. So, and, and then of course, for or against what yeah. we're discussing today. We're discussing that's a great today idea, that, that, owning and operating cool. a private practice and direct payment, not 1099W2. Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, knowing, knowing the current status of licensure uh, kind of helps with uh, evaluation of the comment. So thank you. Go ahead, Christina. Okay, the next person is gonna be uh, Laurel Starkweather. Good afternoon, thank you. My name is Laurel Starkweather and I am currently a counseling graduate student, but I am reading a public comment on behalf of Dr. Samaga, who is a counselor educator and LPC supervisor in Texas. This is her prepared statement. I fully support LPC associates being able to take direct payment for services and create their own private practice. I think it should be the LPC supervisor that makes the determination that the LPC associate is ready for private practice. I believe that an LPC associate should complete half of their 3000 supervised experience hours before they are eligible to start their own practice. Finally, the LPC supervisor should document in their supervision notes that they think that the LPC associate is ready to own and operate a private practice with a brief rationale. Thank you to the board and the rules committee for your service from Dr. LaRaga and also thank you from me. Thank you, Ms. Starkweather. The next person we have is Claudia Perez. Hello, if you guys can hear me okay. Uh, my name is Claudia Perez. I am an LPC. I became LPC only four months ago. So I'm relatively new to this process um, and, and can experience and can explain based off of what I've gone through. Really quickly, I want to say um, just for myself, I'm against LPC associates taking direct payment as well as owning their own private practice. Um, that is simply because LPC associates right now can be employed by their supervisor at the supervisor's private practice. So they can still experience private practice without it being their own business. And I think it would be a mistake to put limitations and say, well, you know, it's not up to supervisors to get liability because then who is liable? The new LPC associate who has maybe three to 700 hours under their belt. I, I disagree mm -hmm. with that and that is my stance. Thanks so much. Thank you, Ms. Perez. Okay, next person we have is Kathleen Mills. Hi, my name is Kathleen Mills. I'm a licensed professional counselor supervisor as well as a certified employee assistance professional. I will not be supervising associates that insist upon private practice ownership, client records ownership, or taking direct payments. I am not willing to risk my practice, license, income, or family, and I am hell bent against going through this again with any associate for any reason. I don't need the risk. Their short-term solution to their personal financial issues fails to protect Joe Citizen to the same extent that the current set of rules does. BHEC was formed out of the Sunset Commission's mandate to strengthen and improve the quality of care received by Joe Citizen. So both BHEC and the LPC board have an obligation to answer this question truthfully. Does granting the petitioner's request improve the care Joe Citizen receives or do him probable harm? If your answer is the latter, then you are obligated to deny the request. It's game over and it's that simple. One it's minute. simply criminal of us as elder generation to knowingly create an environment in which our next generation and the public are sent walking into a trap. We are morally obligated to protect Joe Citizen and properly train associates, even if they don't like it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Mills. Okay, the next person we have is Pete Bailey. Good 
Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Pete Bailey. I'm an LPC associate. And I am in favor of LPC associates being able to take direct payment and to own their own business. Um, as far as the supervision goes, um, LPC supervisors are there to supervise LPC associates in their clinical abilities and in their ability to be a counselor. I've looked at the website for the um, board related to disciplinary actions, and I've not seen one complaint related to business practices being remedied through the board. If a person has a problem with their business license, that would be through the attorney general's office. If they have a problem with their taxes, that would be through the IRS. And if they have a problem with insurance, they would do that with the insurance company. And the board, frankly, would not have any regulatory authority to oversee that. So what we're really talking about here is an LPC associate's ability to get a job, to work, and to, to be their own business partner. One minute. Sir, am I, am I cut off or? Yes, Mr. Bailey, uh, there, one minute has been allotted for each public comment. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. Next person we have is Jessica Nolan. Hi, I'm Jessica Nolan. I'm an LPC associate. Uh, my question is about, well, I guess what I would like to say is that we, we know that LMFT associates have been able to do exactly what we're talking about for some time now, have they not? And I know several people, uh, Dr. Bacon and Kathleen Mills just addressed concerns about LPC associates owning and operating a business while also learning how to be a counselor, you know, new to the practice. And I think we could look to what they have in place to make sure that we also are able to make this work. Uh, some of us as LPC associates are not 22 year olds fresh out of college. I have had many careers. I know how to own and operate a business, but am not able to because of these restrictions. So I would like to put that out there as a consideration as you make your decision. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Ms. Nola. Okay, next person we have is Mona Lisa Bryant. Hi there, uh, my name is Mona Lisa Bryant. I am a licensed professional counselor who also owns a group private practice that um, brings on um, LPC associates to my practice. I am a bit against LPC associates having their own practice. The reason for that is because um, a lot of them are still learning a lot of information. And also with starting my own practice, um, I realize there's a lot of work that comes with that. And so a part of me is unsure that they are properly prepped for that. If it was to be considered, I think that I agree with some of the other um, individuals who have communicated, there does need to be direct guidance on what that would look like. I'm not a supervisor, but I do plan to become one. And that liability piece is very important. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Ms. Bryant. Is there anyone else um, who would like to provide public comment? If so, please raise your hand now. Christina, we probably ought to, we'll need to go down the telephone numbers as well. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, looks like next one is Lori Van. Hello, I'm Lori Van, I'm a LPC supervisor and have been since 2003. And the question that I'm not hearing answered is that I would pose how many of those that are in favor have actually run their own private practices how long have they actually been in a private practice? And how many employees or associates have they actually had underneath them in that managerial position? So that would be the question I would pose as a concern because the liability just isn't about a board complaint. It is about a lawsuit. 
And I want to know how that would be handled as an LPC supervisor, should my associate have a lawsuit filed against them for whatever mistake they may have made. Exactly. I would also ask that consideration be made, which I know is beyond what the board can do to require graduate schools to provide some type of business class because none of us receive that in graduate school. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mann. Christina, about how many do we have left? Um, I have three uh, that have their raise, hand raised and I have two. I have four that have their hand raised and I have two, four, five phone numbers to try. Okay, um, the, that's gonna be, uh, we will take these that have their hands raised and it's, the phone numbers. And again, I'd ask everybody, um, if you have already submitted written comments, um, please do not feel the need to, to join us here for, for a, um, a public comment. Um, and if, uh, uh, please uh, comment if you uh, have something that hasn't been mentioned before. So let's go ahead and cut it off with the ones that have their hands raised and the ones that are on the phone. So we have, um, it looks like one of them put their phone down. Um, so we have three um, with their hands up. First one we're gonna hear is David Martin. Hi, my name is David Martin or David Martin, either way is fine. I'm originally from Spain, so there goes the accent. Really quickly, I've been in private practice since 2011. Uh, I own a group private practice in Katy, Texas, and I have been an LPC supervisor since 2013. So for the last eight years, I've had the privilege to walk along uh, interns and now associates as they get their license. And as of today, I will not supervise any associate who's able to own and operate their own practice. My main reasons for that would be protection to the public and the liability that it puts on them and on myself. 15 seconds. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, this, Mr. Martin. Okay, uh, Claudia Pylan. Hi, Dr. Claudia Pylan here. I'm actually a licensed psychologist, but I do train um, students in counseling and have uh, trained several students who have obtained their LPC. I just want to highlight that we are making assumptions that our students um, or that graduates of counseling programs are not getting the training necessary to open up a private practice. And so I just want to mention that our program specifically does talk um, about private practice in my classes. I have uh, panels of, of private practice um, business owners who come, um, LPCs who speak to my students. Um, so there is some of that training. Just want to highlight that we can't make the assumption and we could always create stipulations for um, specific training necessary. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pilot. Okay, our last person uh, for public comment uh, that has their hand raised will be Dr. Robert Franklin. Good afternoon. Thank you. My name is uh, Dr. Franklin. I am an LPC supervisor. I do own a group practice. I am in favor of allowing LPC associates to accept third party payments. Um, with the, I do endorse uh, and full heartedly agree with TCA and TACE's endorsements. Um, one of my personal experiences also behind this is that we have other mental health professionals, such as psychiatric mental health nurse practitioners, who graduate with a master's degree in 600 hours of practicum and can prescribe immediately at the time of licensure with no, but they will be under supervision as well. So they can so open a practice, they can do things independently. So we do have other mental health professionals that are doing it and that have more care towards our, our providers in the medicine realm. Um, and so we're asking our LPC associates just to have the same equal care. I do believe there does need to be a level of oversight significant towards Tase's ideas. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Franklin. Dr. Franklin, would you mind clarifying for me briefly? You said third-party payer. 
uh, we're discussing direct payment. Um, Sorry, I mean by a, a, a per, another person directly paying to the LPC associate. Sorry. Direct payment. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Okay. I'm um, going to go ahead and go down the phone numbers real quick that we have. Um, the first one, if you, um, your number ends in 4818, I have unmuted, or you should be able to talk and to unmute yourself, it should be star six. Christina, I think they flipped. It's a different okay. number. Yep, that's sure. That is what happened. Uh, so it's actually 2888. Okay. Next one is going to be 4818. Okay. See, next one is the 5398. Okay. And we have the 6062. 9062. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh. 9062. Okay. Looks like last one is going to be 9199. Okay. All right. That okay. completes our public comment for now. All right. Thank you, Christina. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go ahead and uh, begin our discussion. Um, I think the logical starting point would be uh, questions that we have for uh, stakeholder organizations or perhaps anyone uh, that made a, a public comment uh, following the stakeholder presentations. Uh, we got in, uh, Dr. Taylor had a couple questions for, for TASIS and TCA, um, but uh, I believe that, uh, um, I'm sorry, I believe that all of them are, are still participating. Um, it is. We've been uh, we've been going for an hour now. Would everybody like to take a, a brief break before we really dig in? Is everybody okay with that? Okay. Um, if you can, get, uh, let's aim for about two to three minutes, and then uh, we'll come back. A uh, brief break, and then we'll get back into our discussion.
And we still are recording. So whenever we have the rest of our members on, we can just jump right in. Once, uh, once Chris and Gary get back, we'll get started. Okay. And there's one of them. There's the other. All right. Okay, welcome back everybody. Uh, let's go ahead and get into our discussion. Um, do we have questions for uh, uh, those that made presentations on behalf of the stakeholder organizations? Janie, anything that you may have for, for uh, uh, Dr. Allen or, or Mario or Sandra or Chris, anything else to add? I have, I have no questions for the stakeholders at this time. Okay. Chair Hobart, I, I had one question for Ms. Martin, if she would entertain it. Sandra, are you out there? Yes, I'm here. Sandra, when you were up here earlier, you mentioned that it's a uh, people were going to have a very, very hard time trying to find someone to supervise them. I uh, believe if, that. Yeah, if we make this rule change, I guess my question is to you, do you think people have a hard time right now trying to find somebody to supervise them under our existing rule? Um, I think they're more careful in their search. I have the only the only real difficulty I have seen are people who are doing online programs. And I asked somebody why did people didn't want to supervise someone who is doing an online counseling master's. And they said, because they don't know what they're getting. If they're taking a, a master's online, they don't know what quality is in the person who's asking to be supervised. So uh, I, other than online programs, I haven't heard a lot of people that have difficulty finding a supervisor. I'm in the Dallas area, so. I, I guess Sandra, I did you do that. Oh, I apologize, Daryl. Go ahead. I was going to say, Ms. Chair, I'd probably have the same question of TCA and then, uh, you know, of the, of the professional board members we have here on the committee too. I'd like to hear what they have to say about. Well, while, while we've got while we've got Miss Martin pulled up, um, did Christian counselors do a survey of membership about how they felt about the proposed rule change? We didn't do an official survey. We've talked about it. I guess ever since it, was, since it was brought up to begin with, which has been a year or more, I think, I think more than a year. And we've talked about it at all. It, we've talked about it in our board meetings. We've talked about it, you know, just in our chapter meetings with groups, with people. In general, in general, the answer is we are not for it. Uh, it just in terms of our Inner involvement with government. I don't think we're ready to just officially endorse something, but in general, because we're new at our involvement, in general, I think we're probably for it. And certainly everyone, want, every supervisor wants to be severed completely and entirely from any financial connection at all. That, that seems to be a, a recurring theme we hear. And that's, and to, to, just to paraphrase it, it's, it's along the lines of, if you guys do this, this is the these are the other changes that you would have to make for in order for us to uh, to be able to accept the change. So for for Christian counselors, are there are there any other criteria that you would want to see changed other than the, just the delineation of the liability? Um, is, is that the only one that? would be a requirement, again, hypothetically, to where the, mm -hmm. if you guys made this change, we would also want to see this change as well. Yeah. Not in terms of criteria, but this kept running through my mind as I listened to people, and I, and I wanted to say it in the beginning. Uh, the, the associate period, the internship, is not just about technique and orientation and all the rest. It is about, it's a large part of everything inside of you, including all of the trigger points and everything else that keep you from being an effective and a safe counselor. It's about working on those things. They, they just float to the surface. All of the problems you have that would keep you from being a safe, effective counselor begin to be addressed. And so you've got a long time to address them. And if you cut that short, then that person is gonna do that on their own, in their own business, in their private practice, whatever. They're going to do it on their own, and it's hard to do on your own. It's difficult. It's difficult enough to do when you've got a supervisor. 
Okay. Thank you, Ms. Martin. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, Janie, Garrick, uh, Chris, do you guys have any specific questions you want to ask of the stakeholder representatives? Uh, not at this time, Mr. Chair. I read all the documents. They were most informative. Okay. Um, well, obviously, Garrett and I have a different perspective on this issue being public members. So my question here in front of everybody, uh, Janie and Chris, Chris, I know you are, you have associates at Taylor Counseling Group. Um, and they are amazing. Would you, would Taylor, would any supervisors at Taylor Counseling Group be willing to supervise an associate that had their own business and did direct billing? Well, I appreciate the question, Mr. Chair. It is, it is a little unfair uh, because we don't, we don't offer that service anyway. So we only offer um, for internal associates that work for us and they're not allowed to work elsewhere. They have non-competes. So um, during the term of their contract only, if they leave, they're welcome to go anywhere they like. But um, so, so that would be a no, but, but not a, not a no for any of these reasons, just to know from an internal company standpoint, we just, it's just not like, if you wanted to work for me and for Janie's practice, I'd still say no, just because that's just how we operate as a business. Not because I don't think Janie's amazing, just because I'm jealous and <laughs> obsessive. Okay. So what you're saying there is that you respect certain business decisions that, that LPCs make. So for you personally, um, at, at what point do you, do you, there, there's a spectrum of involvement in the business practices for another therapist. And, and at what point do you begin, does that, that liability, um, the, that liability border kick in and where we are getting out of uh, supervision for exclusive, the delivery of professional counseling services and then the discussion on the business practices. Where's that line? For me? Sure. I, I like the cross-examination. Thank you, sir. Um, uh, for me, it, it, my, my, one of my fears is I think somebody brought it up was, was the extent that goes beyond the, the authority of the board, which is malpractice. Um, so, I mean, you get into a malpractice lawsuit, that's a totally different thing. Um, yeah, I'm sure there's gonna be a complaint attached to it. And yeah, we'll deal with the administrative side, but. But I mean, our rules don't really have any impact on on that. So if there's a malpractice complaint that the associate did in their own practice, that supervisor is going to get wrapped up in it regardless of of what we have in our rule book. So so that's an interesting point of concern uh, that that I would have. The other one is going to be is going to be um, the uh, the chain of custody for records. Uh, I know that there's, there's, there's conversation about ownership of records. And I want to be very clear that, you know, therapists don't own records, the client owns the record, but we have a chain of custody for them. And, and so that, that can become a point of confusion. Um, if an associate is, is, is operating out of their own entity. Uh, um, and then also, uh, billing as, 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 as a mechanism for, um, for, for cash flow becomes uh, uh, interesting when you look at it from from two entities, right? Even if they're not billing insurance, right? Or 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 if they're providing a super bill to give to an insurance, there's still there's still a unique um, relationship there that that I think we would have to really kind of think through and, and work through. Okay, Jenny, anything to add on that? Um, so I also employ LPC associates and have in my private practice for a number of years. Um, and, um, you know, in, in looking at this, I'm trying to look at it from all sides. Uh, as, you know, I remember, you know, back in the dark ages when I was an intern, that's what they were called then, um, I, I had a full-time counseling job. That's, that's what I did and was blessed to have a supervisor who invested in me to make sure that I had a really strong foundation um, in uh, my clinical skills, some of the other things that were said in terms of um, identifying my own triggers and uh, establishing 
um, you know, my niche and all that. And, and when I look at that um, supervision season that, uh, or not supervision, yeah, the intern associate season, um, much like the academic season, which is completely focused on learning theory and, um, you know, you have a, a short practicum that gives you an opportunity to kind of, you know, start to dip your feet in the pool. Uh, the supervision season is meant to really ground you in the profession. And I think it would be wonderful if everybody were able to um, find that avenue to get well grounded in the profession. I, and, and I know that's, you know, everybody has their own journey. Um, what I feel my responsibility as a member of this committee and the LBC board, protecting the public, making sure that we're focused on grounding people and their clinical skills. Um, and as a business owner, I'm very much still on that journey. And uh, okay, for, well, to for think about the liability of then taking somebody else's knowledge or lack of there. I would, that's... You, two, you two are both business owners. Mm -hmm. so what part of your 3,000 hours, it was 2,000 hours when you were, no, when you were interns? Three. Huh? Yeah. What? Mine was three. 3,000. Chris, how, how many hours for you? 3,000. To answer your question, 0%. Yeah, none. So how, how much of your 3,000 hours taught you how to be business owners? Zero. None. So, no, my 3,000 hours is about is about the preparing myself as an individual to be a clinician. And I think you've got to be a really strong clinician. This is my personal opinion to then be an effective practice that's going to really be looking at, you know, how do we serve our community? Um, and I mean, because when I started my business, and I came out of a nonprofit world. So I, I worked in the nonprofit world for a long period of time um, and started a practice. Then I had to read all of the, you know, pros and cons between um, do you have a sliding scale or is that inappropriate and considered discriminatory? And, you know, how do you set your fees? I mean, there's, there's so much involved that I needed to be a good clinician so that when I'm in the session, I'm a good clinician. And um, as a supervisor, really focused on that. Well, then it, it explain to me how if, if none of your 3000 hours uh, teaches you how to own a counseling business, um, why is it a requirement that we still finish that 3000 hours before we'll allow it? Because I think you'd be distracted personally. You wouldn't be able to focus on your clinical skills. You'd be trying to get your next, you know, bill paid. Then, do you feel do you feel strongly enough about that that you are not willing to give to let somebody make that decision on their own? I am, and and I I I think I've shared this. Um, I know I've shared in other committee members or whatever. I am trying to look at this from all sides. And my research in the last week, looking, preparing for today's meeting, I really looked at the four uh, member boards for BHEC and tried to look at them side by side by side. And I, I sent mm -hmm. the research that I found. And mm -hmm. what I found is that licensed psychological associates are not allowed to own a practice. Social workers are not allowed to own a clinical practice and LPCs. The MFT, I really, I thought And what I've from the MFT feedback is that most of the MFT associates don't own a practice because their supervisors aren't you know, putting them in that place. And I don't have hard data. And maybe we need to, you know, talk to our other member boards in terms of how their uh, individuals in that associate intern status 
um, how they're able to be successful and ours own, aren't. I mean, what are we not doing for our folks that the other three member boards are doing for their folks? And how can we begin to do that so that, so that our associates aren't feeling that they're not being served? I, yeah. I, I don't know the answer about the other three member boards, how, how their folks yeah. are able to do it. Let me, let me correct one thing on the psych associates. They can own their own business. They're not, they're not required to be employed by the, the supervising psychologist. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I did the, and I need to pull it out. I didn't put that in my note as to where it says they cannot have an independent practice. No, yeah, they're defining it differently. Yeah. I start to say they can own their own business. They just have to have a supervisor up until they gain independent practice authority. Then they, then they don't need a supervisor. Right. But, and but and owning, I'm talking about the folks that are trying to get up to that status to own an independent practice. That's a sex, you know, there are other layers of licensure in there, but no, they're no. new persons. No, they can, they can't like. practice independently, but they can own their own business. That, that is, that's very common for LPAs to own their own business and be mm -hmm. supervised by a psychologist elsewhere. Uh, that, that happens quite often. The yeah, other I thing I saw yeah. between the LPC and MFT is the minimum, minimum standard for supervision hours for the MFT is almost three times the minimum standard for the LPC. And so, so this I think it was annual. Minimum, was it 72 annual is what it, what it works out to. So no, 18 like months times four hours is 72 oh. hours. Oh, but that's if they do it in the minimum. I mean, how many are really right. completing it in 18 months? But, but, that, but you're right. They you're right. Yeah. But you're right. There is a lot more supervision involved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good points. Dr. Taylor, when did you start a uh, Taylor counseling group? Uh, uh, technically, um, the day I quit the hospital, I guess, I don't know. I, I ran off to the middle East for like a, for like a month when I came back and started it. So I think January, uh, um, 25th, 2014, January, 2014, something like that. Yeah. Like basically as soon as I could essentially. Yeah. And, and I was already working in my, how many years, um, past your hours requirement did you start it? Uh, it, pretty much immediately for all intents and purposes. Okay. Would you have started it earlier if the rules had allowed it? Uh, probably. Yeah. Okay. Um, why do you, why do you feel as though that uh, you, you would have been successful starting it during, during your associate period? Well, one of the things I had, uh, and this is just my personal experience, but I, I was very gifted to have a wonderful, wonderful supervisor. Uh, I mean, Dr. Prince Jones was absolutely amazing. Uh, he was one of my graduate professors and we were very close. Uh, so I, I was very fortunate that we had a great relationship and, uh, and I mean, I had a wonderful experience. Um, so I, I was fortunate to be in his practice. So I, I don't know, it's kind of hard to look back and say, yeah, I definitely would have. I mean, there's a part of me that probably would have really wanted to, I don't, maybe I wouldn't have because I had such a great, I mean, I had a great relationship with him. So, so he was definitely getting me clients and, and I mean, I wasn't making like bank or anything, but I wasn't, you know, hurting. Uh, uh, but I also recognize that there are a lot of associates that don't have that that don't have that experience. And I recognize that there are also bad supervisors out there, just like there are bad everything. I, uh, I uh, For me, it comes down to, are, are we gonna keep a, a rule in place that doesn't let anybody do it? Or if we, took, if we took the rule away, we let them make the decision for themselves, just as, just as you would have made the decision for yourself. Yeah. Yeah, it is a tough, it's kind of like, <laughs> I, I, uh, I mean this in a, in a genuine way. It's kind of like telling an 18 year old to pick which college they're going to go to, you know, like it's such a big choice to have to make so young. Um, uh, just, I mean, from my experience, but I recognize that that's not everybody's experience. I recognize that some associates have MBAs. Uh, I recognize that some associates were, were dentists and just wanted to change their life, you know, decided that this was the thing to do. I recognize it's a second career for some of them. I, I totally get that. I'm not unilaterally opposed. Uh, I just think the uh, we got to make sure it's done properly 
If, would if you think if, if someone had an undergraduate degree in accounting and then they go and they get their master's in counseling and they become an LPC, are they more equipped to start their own business? I don't know. That's a good I, question. I don't know that they would get into a counseling program with uh, an accounting degree. Any business degree? <laughs> I don't know. Are there any accountants here that we can ask? I don't know. Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. Um, I, I mean, there's you know, owning a, I mean, there's a lot of different ways to own a business too. Just like there's a lot of different ways to do therapy. I mean, you can, you can be in private practice and own your own business and only have four clients and, you know, sublease a space from somebody else that's fully furnished and you have like one or two expenses, you know, and, and, and then you can own a business that's, that's larger, more like mine. That's extremely complex. And, and we have to deal with a lot of complex stuff every day. Um, so I, that's, a, that's an A plus humble brag there, Dr. Taylor. You don't want to be, you don't want to be in my shoes. Uh, uh, so, you know, when we make choices that have impacts <laughs> on a lot of people's lives. Okay. Well, that's uh, interesting that you yeah. make choices because what it keeps coming back to me for is, are we going to keep a rule in place that just says thou shalt not, or do we, do we, uh, do we take away that rule and let's say, if you want to do it, you're, you're allowed to. If you think that you can do it, if you think you can be successful, we'll allow it. And yeah. I have to think, what's the impact on the public? Sure. Okay. Absolutely. Yes. That, that gets back to my original framework discussion. Can this be done without a material increase in risk to the public? So, uh, you know, I, I think of, of our role and in our, in our, in our duty here as, as a board is, is a number one to protect the public and then two to set minimal standards. Set minimal standards. We're not here to define best practice. We're here to determine what are minimal standards in protecting the public. Uh, I, I don't know that we have data to support that this would cause harm to the public or, or that it wouldn't. Uh, I don't know that we have hard data to actually support that either way. Um, so, so let's put that topic on hold and say, let's come back to that. Um, and, and then let's look at it um, from the other point of view, which is, which is there, there's, there's only two ways to go here. Either they do or they don't. If, if they do, we have a lot of problems. We, we have to work out billing. We have to work out records. We have to work out liability. We have to work out relationships uh, between the entities, those types of things. Without stepping on TWC's toes and without, without, without causing Daryl to have a heart attack for creating 50 new forms for them to fill out. You know, uh, so, so we got to navigate that on the other side, if we don't, there are concerns about antitrust. There are concerns that we're not allowing people to own and operate a business, which, which I'm firmly opposed to. Uh, and those are big issues that we have to tackle as well. So, uh, um, I don't have an easy answer for you, Mr. Chair. I'm sorry. Janie, anything to add to that? You know, when I think about, you know, and the arguments being um, we are in a mental health crisis, all that type of thing, the, what we're discussing, though, is not going to bring one additional clinician to the state of Texas. Um, so we're not increasing our pool of clinicians. Um, and so I don't, I don't think that uh, is going to meet that need for that mental health crisis. Uh, those rural uh, counties that some of which don't have a single LPC associate in them, are some of these associates gonna move to those counties? I mean, is that is that the plan to serve them? And then how do those underserved communities then access their private practice when they're a cash-based uh, business? How do, you, how do you respond to the argument that you are stymieing the pool of providers because you've got a group of associates. If they can't find a supervisor, they can't practice. And that with this rule change, you're going to increase the ability um, for people yeah. to seek out supervisors. How do you, how do you counter that argument? And, and I think we need to figure out how people, how come people are not able to find a supervisor? Um, if there are actually you know, person for person, more supervisors than associates, even if every supervisor only had one supervisor, there's a pool of supervisors left over. If I'm looking at the numbers right, 5,300 supervisors, 4,500 associates. And that's kind of where I was, when I mentioned earlier, I'd like to hear from TCA on, do they, do they think 
that there is an issue with associates being able to find supervisors because yeah. I just, I'd like to hear from them and see, do they think that's a problem? If so, what do they think the problem is? And that's and probably a fair look, question for Sandra and Summer Allen as well. Yeah, Daryl, I think that is a fair question. And I think uh, it's still new, but I mean, it's been, oh, I think less than a year, maybe a year since we, since we took the cap off of, of online supervision. So they can now do supervision, you know, I mean, from El Paso to, uh, mm -hmm. to uh, uh, Texas Range, County. County. Range yeah. County to Gaines County. Yeah, uh, and, and uh, you know, not every supervisor supervisee is going to be a fit. So if there's a supervise, if there's a, as a, if there's an associate out there that can't find a supervisor, maybe the board needs to be helping them work on whatever it is they need to be working on, so that a supervisor would be able to be willing to take them on as a liability. Um, I don't take on every person that applies to me. You want the board to take on that responsibility? No, no. I'm just saying oh. to help. If if a, if a, if an associate's out there going, I'm not able to find a supervisor. Let's you know have some kind of I don't know what it needs to be. Dr. Taylor, you can do a TED talk on how to make yourself, uh, you know, be appealing to a supervisor. <laughs> <laughs> kind of thing please, please, but yeah. but in terms of numbers the numbers don't don't seem to indicate that, that we're lacking supervisors um, now if a, if an associate for whatever reason seems to be a risk and supervisors aren't willing to take them on is that a supervisor problem or an associate um, type of thing I, and you know I do um, and, and uh, Dr. Allen Dr. Summer Allen you may not know the answer but the question about unfair fees for supervision uh, I, you know maybe go back and survey your folks as what they think would be a fair fee um, you know that that might be part of it one of the comments that I read somebody said that they pay somewhere in the neighborhood I, I, I mean I remember the number it was twenty four hundred dollars a year for supervision so if we do the math divide by 12 uh, and then four hours for those 12 months so divide by another four that's fifty dollars per supervision hour is that unfair is that an unfair charge for somebody who has been in the yeah. field as long and become a supervisor to charge $50 for a supervision hour. I um, wonder, I wonder if her concern was more in the line that it was that plus I was giving 40 to 60% of income revenue to the practice, meaning that like, but, but like I think we've got to look at supervision and, and yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. Can we ask Dr. Allen real quick? Do you have a, a does the LPC Association, LPC uh, Association of Associates, does it have a recommended uh, uh, fee for supervision that, that the associates seem to feel is fair? But before we go down that road, I guess my question to y'all is what would be our authority to even regulate that? Right. Uh, there wouldn't but, be, but I'm just curious. Okay. But I think they're asking us to regulate that. Yeah, but I, what I'm telling you is, is um, that that's probably a non-starter. Uh, jumping off into a uh, setting caps or fees that that's mm, right. No, that, I totally agree. With very that. very no uncomfortable interest. with that. I have no interest in telling a supervisor how to run their business. But yeah. what I what I am interested in is if if we can't find a solution that works for this road, maybe there is another road where we create some more structure for the supervisory process. Um, you know, maybe that's a, an alternative road we have to go down. So perhaps maybe Dr. Allen can give us some recommendations on that. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you, great. Um, so I'm not, I do not believe that the board or anyone should regulate what an LPC supervisor charges. I don't believe that. I believe that supervisors should be able to operate their business the way that they see fit and set their fees. I don't want you all telling me how much I can charge my clients. Uh, and so our organization does not support that. Uh, I, I want to speak to something about around the supervision fees. I know that when you read through our, our data, you likely see a lot of associate comments saying, I shouldn't have to pay for this. This is too much. 
I just want to be clear that that's actually not our organizational statement. While we do have members that believe that, we work to educate them that th this is not a free thing. And if you think you're paying too much, you need to either talk to your supervisor about that or you need to look for another supervisor. It's, we, we should not decide what the supervisor charges. Uh, in no way will we endorse any regulatory authority from any entity uh, telling supervisors what they can and can't charge. I, we don't support that. Um, in terms of LPC Associates trying to find a supervisor, I, I don't want to spend my, my time rehashing the unpleasant data from the last meeting. I don't think that anyone enjoyed that. What I will say is that associates struggle not to find an LPC supervisor, but those associates who want to own and operate a private practice and want to learn that while they're under supervision, as I did, I had an excellent supervisor that helped me clinically, helped with countertransference, and helped with private practice stuff. Um, those individuals who would like to do that, what they struggle with is finding an LPC supervisor who is not 1099ing, and I know that we're, that's not the topic today, but they struggle with that, and they struggle with finding someone that is not charging five, six hundred dollars in supervision fees a month, which does happen, and paying self-employment taxes, and giving away 40 to 60 percent of their fee. That is what the struggle is here. Um, individuals that are in agency settings, um, I believe that they are not necessarily facing that because the supervisor has no access to their paycheck from a different entity. Associates are struggling to find LPC supervisors who are not taking high percentages of their client fee on top of the supervision fee, on top of the website fee, the psychology today, the self-employment tax, and the list goes on and on. I don't know if that helps clarify, but that is what I believe the, the current issue is in terms of associates looking for a supervisor when they want to get that private practice uh, experience or supervision assistance. It, it does, Dr. Allen. Thank you. So um, what I'm kind of hearing you say is that, is that um, the, this association is not interested in, in telling supervisors what to do or how to do it. You're just looking for uh, what you hope to be a free market balance to the solution. Is that what you're saying? 100%. When, associate, when an associate sends me a message and says, I interviewed a supervisor and they want me to pay six fifty a month for supervision alone. My answer is go interview someone else. Yeah. So do you have any fear um, that, uh, that if this rule were to move forward, that of these 5,000 supervisors, only half a dozen or a dozen are going to agree to supervise and associate in their own business and their own practice? I don't have that fear. I have a, a two-part answer. So in the data that we collected, which I apologize for the numbers of pages that you all received from me, but I did want you to have the data. Mm -hmm. um, of our LPC supervisors that completed that, I think that was approximately 100 people. We had tried to reach as many people as we could. Half of them said no. They don't want associates in private practice. Yeah. 25 or so said that they do. And 25 or so said, maybe. When yeah. I looked back at the comments, those maybes were attached to liability concerns. Mm -hmm. And so my final comment on this is that I don't have this concern. And the reason why, and I, I really want to highlight this, if LPC supervisors, if all but 10 LPC supervisors in the state of Texas say, I'm not doing this, I am not supervising an associate in a private practice, then guess what? We wouldn't have very many associates in a private practice. It just wouldn't happen. And so the idea that, is, that supervisors will just abandon supervision and leave supervision, they still hold the authority to not approve a site. And if 5,300 5, say no, well, then we have no associates in Texas owning and operating a private practice. It's still their discretion. Yeah. Okay. Hey, Christina, it's my understanding that uh, 
uh, Dr. Elder came on board and, and wanted to make a comment. Um, I, I'd like to work her in based on uh, her work and her familiarity with this issue up until uh, the time she left us. So go Should ahead, Matter. Should we allow LMF? There's Dr. Jody Elder, Rules Committee Member Emeritus. Hi, everyone. Wow, Thank Emeritus. You. Emeritus, yes. Thank you all. It's good to see your faces and to hear your um, fruitful discussion as usual. I miss being a part of the team. Um, I just want to say that I really appreciate um, this discussion today and wanted to highlight a few things that have jumped out at me as we've been talking. Is um, I really like Ms. Stubblefield's idea about surveying the other mental health boards about how they are successfully navigating the associate phase, because I think there is something missing for our LPC associates that we certainly need to hear and understand more about how those needs can be met. If indeed we don't go the private practice route, because if we don't, I, I don't even know that the private practice route is the panacea or the answer to some of the concerns that are being brought forward. And it's very concerning to me that we have so many LPC associates who are unhappy and are having bad experience. We certainly want qualified, competent professionals to come into this field. And so I think it's important to listen to those concerns and then go talk to the other boards and say, how are you doing this? And these are the concerns our people have. What rules and stipulations do you have in place that are helping to support your associates? And I think that that is certainly a worthy route of information for collection um, and exploring. The other thing is I really appreciate Ms. Stubblefield's point, which I had not considered before, which is that we really wouldn't be increasing access to mental health care in Texas by providing private practice access because LPC associates are providing services currently. So I don't think that's an answer there either. Um, I am worried about the unintended consequence of not being able to provide to find an LPC supervisor for LPC associates who want to go into private practice, given what we've heard from LPC supervisors who weighed in today. Um, and I'm also doubly concerned about the distraction that a private practice might provide during the associate phase, because I really like the analogy of the academic season where you're focused on book learning. The, associate season where you're focused on developing your clinical skills and yourself as a clinician. And then post that is when you would be able to feel competent enough as a clinician to then be able to focus on developing your business expertise. So I'm worried that we might have the unintended consequence of having supervision time be divided between here's how you develop your business practice and here's how you develop your clinical practice whereas the clinical phase is about developing us as clinicians and making sure that we provide services to the Texas public in the most efficient and effective manner possible. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Dr. Elder. Um, while we have you, since you got involved in this issue, did your opinion change one way or the other as you did more research on it? I honestly um, have not. I, I initially had some gut reactions that were like, ooh, I'm not sure this is a good idea. And I prefer to do things by committee. <laughs> so I reached out to every person that I know who's in the field and got all this feedback and input in addition to all the public comment, which I also appreciate. And the overarching concern, I, everybody says, my gut says no, but then they have this trouble articulating why not. And I think that what we, the concerns that have been brought up today are the why nots that people have trouble articulating. And I, at the same time, I've also heard many supervisors say, I'm really saddened by the fact that associates are so disgruntled and unhappy and we need to address that. But I don't think that the private practice access is the way to address it. Thank you, Dr. Elder. Uh, we are adding some of those items to the agenda for the next BHEC meeting uh, to discuss uh, rules across the four boards. So that'll definitely be a part of it. Um, so I'm looking forward to getting into that. I, I, Let me. I don't. I don't think anybody views. Um, 
allowing associates to own their private, I don't think that anybody views that as the magic bullet that is gonna solve all the associate problems. I, I, think, I think the argument is really, why, why, do we, why can we not make this decision for ourselves? If we feel, if, you know, it, we all agree, this will not solve all the associate issues, but for some associates, the, one that fe the ones that feel as though this is the right path for them, perhaps for them personally, it does solve the problem. And we, it, it's not a question of whether, if we recommend that path or not, it's a question of whether we would remove the barrier and allow them to make that decision for themselves. Do you have a question? I thought that was a comment, so. No, no it was a comment. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I guess I, I have a question, Mr. Chair. Um, I know in Ms. Doublefield mentioning, you know, surveying the other boards, I guess my question from a very practical standpoint is, is you've got the ED, your general counsel, your board administrator here. Why don't you survey us? You got us right here, right now. Uh, you want to know how the other boards do it? Here, here we sit. We're candidly, we're probably going to be a better resource. I, I don't know how we would go about surveying the other boards. If you send something out, it's just going to be staff answering it for the other boards. So I'm like, Patrick and I can certainly answer any questions you have about psychology. Uh, Tim, we got Tim Spear on, can answer questions about social work. So ask away. The, the, where, typical, the typical example we hear is the comparison with LMFT on how they do it. Uh -huh. uh, so just to clarify, uh, LMFTs can, as associates, can um, own their own practice and bill independently. Is that correct? Correct. Then why is the rule different? I mean, why is the rule different for LMFTs than LPCs? Okay, well, then maybe, maybe the why part I may not be able to answer. But what I can tell you is, I, I, I think one of the things that we're, we're a lot of a lot of people are glossing over is, um, what are, what can we learn from the LMFT program? All of these problems that I hear people articulate in the comments, whether they be written or verbal today, why aren't we seeing any of those problems in the MFT program? Are, if are this, we no, we're we not. not. Okay. I Percentage-wise, isn't isn't the the number of MFTs less than ten percent? I mean, I think it may be five percent of the number of LPCs. It does, but what I'm telling you is, is as a whole, you guys are these professions are just not problematic. We're not seeing the problems that this parade of horribles that everybody thinks. And and then and the it, flip side, the the supervision requirement. Should we then have a parity in supervision where there is that minimum standard for those or minimum hours, minimum? Uh, yeah, you're talking about that hours, that, that mm -hmm. hours issue. I, and I, I guess one other thing that I, I don't think we're looking at is I know Christina has done some research on other jurisdictions, and we haven't seen the, the parade of horribles happen in those other jurisdictions where this is permitted. So yeah. before we start, you, <laughs> <laughs> I'm a kind of a practical guy. And so when I, when I look at this issue, I'm like, well, let's look and see where it's already been done before and see what happened there. And, and I don't see any of these bad things happening in those jurisdictions. So I'm like, how do we get past that? If it's, if this has already been tried in one, in a sister board of yours, and it's been tried in several other jurisdictions and these, this parade of horribles hasn't happened. And we're, it's kind of like what we talked about just a minute ago. Not everybody is going to do this. This is not going to be all 4,000 and something LPC associates that do this. Yeah. We're not taking away the choice of the supervisor. Can somebody point me to some data? Because what I'm hearing is a lot of this is what I think. And when this gets to the council and when this gets to the governor's office, what you think won't matter. It's what you can show, what you can prove. You've got to go down, there's, there's a list of factors that the council looks at in its rulemaking, and you have got to be able to demonstrate under those factors uh, any kind of anti-competitive 
uh, you know, regulation that you've got on the books. And that's exactly what Aaron Bennett, who is the, the, the attorney that's in charge of the regulatory compliance division at the governor, that's what she's going to be looking at is yeah. what can you show me? I want to see some hard numbers. Give me something uh, to justify this type of regulation. And I'm not seeing it. Um, so help me out here. Help me understand that. Well, you know, Daryl, my, my concern is that it seems to me the more I read uh, what other states are doing and what other boards are doing is that is that there absolutely is no parity anywhere. Uh, everybody is doing it very differently. I mean, we look at some of these states like Maine where you can do it, but you can't diagnose. You can have your own practice, but you can't diagnose. And then you look at Ohio that says, sure, but it's like it's, it's just the first. It's an LPC. And then there's this whole other thing above that. Again, you can't diagnose. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, LMFTs are two years and, and 200 hours of supervision, like Janie's saying, and we're, we're 18 to five months. LPAs are, are a terminal degree. Ours is a temporary one for five. It's, it's, it, there seems to be such, <laughs> such an arbitrary approach to this uh, uh, across the, I don't know, hundreds of, of licensing boards, mental health licensing boards we have in this country. Uh, it, it's just it's just more and more confusing the more we look at it. Um, I, I'm not I'm not opposed to the idea. Uh, uh, my concern, and it's not so much what other people are doing. I, I look around and I'm looking to see what other people are doing, and it seems like we're all kind of doing our own thing, uh, uh, which is is not necessarily bad. Um, so I just the, the arguments that say, well, these people can do it, so we should be able to do it, seems to just be kind of dead on arrival to me because we're all kind of just doing things very differently. I would like to get that synced up. I'd like for our four, our four boards at least to okay. have some kind of, some kind of um, um, you know, uh, unity across as best we can. And that's a conversation we'll have. In but more Dr. Depth. Taylor, yeah. what I hear, yes. what I hear Daryl saying is yes, there are a hundred different ways to do it. Right. However, even with a hundred different ways to do it, we don't see uh, under one specific way, we don't see the parade of deplorables. Right. right. I'm, I'm, how you put yeah, it I'm, there. Getting to, I'm getting to that part. Parade uh, of horribles, not deplorables. Of hor <laughs> uh, sorry. Horribles. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm getting to that part. My, my, my issue is, is not so much that these things are going to occur. My, my concern is how do we do it well so that they don't occur? Because I don't know what these other states are doing. I also don't know how big their populations are. I have a colleague in Oregon where they're like, oh, we, we, you can just pretty much, you roll out of grad school, you can do whatever you want. We're cool with that. But they only have like a hundred licensees, you know? And that's not an exaggeration. They don't have very many. Uh, and, and there's other states like uh, uh, Greg in, in North Dakota. I know Greg Searles in North Dakota. Uh, they, we had, we had a client move to North Dakota that wanted to continue to do therapy. So I called their board and they just approved us over the phone. And I was like, well, can I get that in writing, please? Because I don't want this to go south. And they're like, if you really need it to, sure. But come on over. We don't care. Uh, because they literally don't have many people there. So so that's kind of so, yeah, I mean, maybe there aren't this parade of horribles. But is it is it I, I don't know. Is, is there not enough people for it to happen to yet? I, I don't know. Uh, it, it's so complex and it's so confusing. Um, so my, my thought process is maybe let's look at both sides and and maybe we can hammer out appropriate rules for both solutions and just kind of weigh them and see how they look once we have something structured. Well, let's assume that we are gonna do it. Let's craft rules that look like that. And let's assume that we aren't gonna do it. And let's craft rules that look like that. Cause it seems to me that either way we walk out of this, we, we gotta have some kind of adjustment somewhere. Okay, well, you're talking about the rules we have to craft. So Chris, Janie, tell me, let, let's let's take the assumption that uh, the rule is going to change, that we are going to allow uh, you're you're forced to accept it, that um, associates can own their own practice and they can do direct billing. You realize, OK, I have to accept it. Tell me the conditions that you would put in place to where you'd be like, OK, I, I can go back. I can sleep at night again because these rules are in place. And while I may disagree, with the change. However, these protections in place make it to where I can live with it. So tell me what those would be. For, for me, it just comes down to four things. And, and I appreciate the arguments about academics and tests and hours of supervision. Uh, I, I struggle to find 
you know, hard data to suggest that this test over that means that you're going to be a better clinician, right? Um, so, so I, I appreciate those arguments. For me, it comes down to four practical pieces. One uh, is that there is a very clear, and I don't, I know you're not going to like this, Daryl, but I'm not talking about bringing the site forms back. I hated the site forms. I got rid of the site forms, okay? Uh, uh, despite how hard staff fought against me for that, we got rid of them. We got rid of those. I don't want those back. But there needs to be some kind of acknowledgement from the supervisor, whether it's just a box they check or something they sign or whatever that just says on the master application, whatever, that says, I acknowledge that this associate is in their own, is, is operating their own business. So that way the, the supervisor fully understands what they're signing up for. And we can cite some of those rules there or, or, have a hyperlink to those rules or, or whatever we need to have to make the form, you know, as user friendly as possible. So I think that's number one. Uh, two is we have to have a, a, a real conversation about liability and figure out how to manage that well. And, and on top of that, we have to make sure that the supervisor, and while it's not necessarily our responsibility, but the supervisor ought to know that that is limited to our regulations, not mental practice lawsuits not business uh, issues, you know, that, that stuff's outside of us. So, so you're still taking that on to some degree, you know, whether that's some kind of, of fraudulent billing or, or, or whatever, I don't know. Uh, you're still taking that on to some degree, right? Uh, number three is going to be billing. How, how are we managing billing and billing related records, uh, how, making sure that those rules are very clear uh, and then number four is going to be custody of records, uh, making sure that that process is, is well-defined. Um, I think those four things, um, if, if that was the, the assumption, that's the way we were going, I, I feel like I would have to, at a base level, have those four things addressed uh, before feeling comfortable um, moving forward. But Janie, the same question. If you had, if it, if it, if you had no choice in it, but you could put in some protections or some stipulations, what would they be? So, um, and mine's going to go back to that academic season. Uh, one of the things that I understand, uh, and let me put my disclaimer out there: in all things, at all times, I reserve the right to be wrong. I know Daryl likes my disclaimer, <laughs> um, but what I understand is those KCEP KCREP programs require individuals in that uh, practicum student, practicum intern, whatever label they choose to one, be supervised by a LPC supervisor, somebody who's at a supervisor status and require a higher number of hours. It's the 700 hours. Christina, give me a nod. Yeah, KCREP uh, programs require 700 hours. Non-KCREP programs allow the students to be supervised by anybody on whatever site they're at um, and then their academic person sign off on their hours. And what I've seen personally is there's a huge, huge disparity between what somebody who was supervised by an LPC supervisor during their academic training understands about the rules and a uh, student coming out, a fresh graduate who was never supervised by an LPC supervisor. And, and so I think part of it is going back and looking at what we're willing to accept from programs um, to uh, who are preparing. And, and I heard um, Dr. Allen talk about that's one of her group's uh, you know, primary roles is educating people. And she made the comment that she feels like some of the um, graduate programs aren't fully preparing them to understand what, what's going on, you know, like what they should expect and paying for supervision and, and all of that. Um, and so, so I think, you know, and, and that's outside our jurisdiction. I understand that, but we do have the ability to say, well, accept this or not accept this. I, right. Am I, in the application side, um, if from there, we, I think we really got to look at how do we then, you know, look at the supervision requirements 
Um, I, you know, our LPC associates are saying, hey, my MFT friends can do this, but they've got to do a minimum of 200 supervision hours. And it's in a 24 month period. And so do we, ex you know, lengthen the supervision what? requirement for LPC associates to match MFT associates? Like what, what do we do? I'm sorry, Jenny, what is the additional 200 hours required of LMFT? Mm -mm. No, that's the minimum. They have to have a minimum of 200 supervision hours where before an LPC associate the, can-, wait, can no, uh, The minimum of 200 before they can do what? Where they can be fully licensed as an MFT. Okay. Where yeah, the, ours- The LMFT associate is just a 200 hours, right? Ours is a, a, a accordion model. So you can go, you know, you can get it done in 18 months and then you're only technically doing 72 hours or maybe it might take you five years and you're doing this many hours. Uh, the associates just said 200. That's 200. The LMFT is 200. Okay. Actually, it's it's minimum, and I think then it's yeah. it's a weekly. Well, I don't know. I have to go back and look at what my research yeah. was. So yeah, it's two, it's 200 hours, at least 100 hours, which has to be individual, and no more than 50 can be via telephonic. Okay, no is, there, is there any room here for that um, you'll be allowed to do this once you met a certain number of your total 3,000 hours? I, one, you, of the, one of the public comments suggested that. Yeah, and I, and I had thought about that, Steve. My, my concern with that is it, 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 it's kind of, it doesn't really answer the question. It doesn't really solve the problem. Um, because it's still not addressing the other side, which is the antitrust stuff, um, you know, uh, of being non-competitive. Uh, it's, it's not really fixing that. It's just saying you can be an associate, but we're going to give an arbitrary number of 1500 hours. And now you can, now you can have your, you can go and open your own business. So we're still doing the same stuff. We're still telling them they can't be in, you know, business. We're still, I mean, it doesn't really solve that. It just says, well, you can do it after half your time instead of full time. I'm curious also is that does that then lend to the question that the supervisor becomes a gatekeeper and then the supervisor is involved in antitrust? I don't know that. We'll just throw some more questions out there and stir the pot. I, I don't I don't think it's going to bring any antitrust liability on the supervisor because when you talk about antitrust, you're talking about economy wide. And that's what we're doing. When we issue a rule, we're affecting an entire body, whereas one supervisor mm -hmm imposing something on an individual supervisee doesn't affect the economy as a whole. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about, I'm not worried about tangling our supervisors up in that. But, but then what about the requirement for them to be the gatekeeper on who can and can't versus who they're willing, what sites they're willing to supervise? I mean, technically uh, they can do that now. No, yeah. I, yeah, yeah, I understand that. Uh, I wouldn't say that they would become gatekeepers at that point. They're just entering into a free market relationship. Um, so they're choosing not to eat a red lobster because they don't like lobster. Okay. But did I understand that the supervisor judges whether or not somebody's ready to. Uh, uh, have that was their somebody, own somebody made that comment. Okay. Yeah. I don't, no. I don't agree with that. Um, okay. my, my argument, if we were to go that route would, would say that it would just be up to the supervisor to decide if they want to take this person on or not. And in, 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 in that way, they would be deciding, but, but it's not like you have to go out and get a supervisor and then wait so many months, you know, and then say, am I ready for my own practice now? You know, it's, it's not, yeah, I, I would not support that path. You know, there, I remember uh, there was a comment in the, you know, couple comments that we were offered to read that said, what happens if somebody, uh, if an LPC associate starts their own business, but then doesn't complete their licensure in five years? Uh, well, technically, there's nothing stopping you from owning a counseling business. You do not have to be licensed in the state of Texas to open a counseling business. Okay, but you just wouldn't be able to practice out of it. For, you could be for life coach. Could be life what coach. we're doing here. Uh, do you understand my question? Well, I do understand. Yeah, I understand it. There, but there, there, it, it's a, it, it's a non. It doesn't matter because 
they just wouldn't be able to practice out of it as a professional counselor. They would just have to change their name from, you know, Jim's professional counseling services group to Jim's life counts, you know, life coaching group or something like that. I mean, they could still own their own business. They can still own that business. They just can't do therapy out of it. They can't provide professional counseling because at that point they're not licensed. I think, I think what the question is, what she's trying to get at is if the, the, Maybe I don't understand the question. Yeah, the practice ends, what happens to the patients and where do they go? And I think the current rule in, in 681.41 talks about they have to establish uh, a plan for termination uh, potentially. Yeah. So if they're no longer licensed, they can no longer provide those services. So the current rules currently address that. It says if they don't get their license within five years, they can reapply and get their LPC associate license again. But in the meantime, you know, you need to have a, something in place that transitions them to the supervisor or another another licensee that can that can uh, have that continuity of care for uh, for those particular people. I think it would be the, it would be the same as if they became incapacitated or or died. Like you would still have to have the 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 death clause in the contractor and their uh, their um, informed consent. One one weird result from a. The hypothetical that Ms. Stubblefield just gave us is if if we tell supervisors at the 1500 hour mark you don't have the right to say whether or not an individual can now own a business but ultimately the supervisor has the ultimate say whether or not you can even become fully licensed anyway so we're saying you can't tell them whether or not you can own the business but you get to have the final say in whether or not they're qualified to become fully licensed mm -hmm. um, that's kind of a weird I don't know how to explain that. Um, kind of a weird outcome. Garrett, can I put you on the spot? Come on. I, I want to hear your perspective as um, you're still pretty new to this, that uh, you, you, you don't have your, your head poisoned by all, all this rules talk at, at this point. Heck, you've never even met any of us. Um, <laughs> As, as an outsider perspective, do you look at this and I, you, you strike me as a pro free enterprise business guy, do you look at this as an unreasonable restraint on, uh, on an associate's ability to start a business, get out there, uh, drive the economy, or do you view it as the, these protections in place are keeping the public safe and we should not change them? I kind of think about it in a couple of different buckets. Um, Jessica Nolan said earlier, she made a good point, I thought. She said that not all LPC associates are 22 years old. And I think that's a good point because in, in my mind, I obviously think it's, it's great to have, you know, provide more access to these professionals. But at the same time, I find myself contemplating how do we enable and empower these people that want to start their businesses that maybe are further along in their career, like Dr. Taylor pointed out earlier, where these people have different careers or they have MBAs or they have, um, you know, they've had a whole other profession before this and they are a little bit more savvy with how business operates and how, so I find myself questioning, how do we empower those people? Um, but also the 22 year old LPC associates who the people that are newer to business how do we protect, as Kathleen Mills said, Joe Citizen from not getting hurt? And so I'm kind of on the fence um, because one part of me wants to um, give, give these folks that want to start their business every resource possible to be successful. But I also am hesitant of giving, you know, giving folks the keys to go start their own business that might not be fully prepared to offer the best um, best services to people that need it. Yep, I, I agree, that's good insight. Um, I, I, I think that, um, I, I think you uh, kind of, in your preparations for this meeting, you kind of uh, asked around to, to friends of yours, correct? I did, yeah. Um, oh, is it, is there a consensus opinion on it or is there no consensus all over the board? 
There's no consensus. Um, most of the people that I visited with are earlier in their careers, um, I would say sub 30 years old. And it, it was kind of a mix between, uh, but I, a mix between some pro and some against, but I would say 60, 40 of, of wanting the ability to build for services and wanting the ability to start their own private practice. So it wasn't overwhelming, but most of the folks I talked to were for. Do you, do you think that it's based on their, um, their experience as an associate? They had a negative, if they had a negative experience, then they would feel I'm more likely to want to be able to have the ability to start my business but versus a positive experience where they, they kind of felt, eh, nah, I, there's no way I could do it. I think it was more of the folks that I visited with have the entrepreneurial spirit of wanting to have their own business. Okay. So do you have, yeah, I, I talked to, you know, I, I asked uh, Janie and Chris, I said, if you had to accept this rule change, but you're allowed to put in some protections or some stipulations, do you have any that you would add to what, uh, what they've already offered? Um, not necessarily. I, I feel like I'm more for this though now with like Dr. Taylor said, some parameters of, to go along with it. Okay. All right, thank you. And that, that's my, my fresh or my thin perspective. No, the, the, the uh, not, not having been uh, corrupted by the system, that's a, that's a good perspective to still have. Uh, th that's what we're here for. We, we represent the public and we have to kind of offer the outsider's view. And yep. I, under, I understand with this rule change to an outsider, it, depending on kind of how, how you choose to take it, it can look problematic on either direction. It's problematic right. as in, you tell these people have master's degrees and they can't start a business. They're still right. supervised, but you also get told, oh my goodness, we're, you're turning these people loose on, on the public. So, right, exactly. All right, I appreciate it. Okay. So, uh, in, in an, an attempt to sort of narrow the scope of our discussion, it, it does kind of seem like there is a cautious willingness to say that if the board were to approve this rule change, I would only get on board with it with the following stipulations. It, it, is that a fair statement for where we're at right now? Mm, I disagree. I think, I think there are polar sides. I think there are people who would be willing to get on and people who vehemently oppose. Um, uh -huh. And then some that are, you know, kind of could see. And I think actually Dr. Allen spoke to that. I think she said her, say, her survey of supervisors, um, and I don't remember her exact numbers, but, but there was a, a a pocket that said, no, we weren't on board, a pocket that said we were, and a pocket said maybe. So we might need it. And so, so I, I don't think everybody's saying, yeah, we're on board. I, I think it's still. Uncertain. What are your thoughts about the, the, the four of us or the nine uh, of the full board? Oh, yes. I guess I think that, I think that's what Steve's trying to get at is. Is, is there enough of us? Oh, are you are you asking about no. board members? Or are you asking about the members no, in the profession? I'm, I'm just trying to, to narrow down a statement that we can kind of say yay or nay to. We could even phrase it the other direction. We could say, I am against this rule change. However, under the following circumstances, I would be willing to accept it. It can go either way. I'm trying to see if we can come out of this meeting today um, with a, a result from all this discussion. Okay, and I'm going to need somebody who uh, you know is is real clear on Robert's rules. We've got a rule proposed, and so do we need to vote that up or down? And then, I mean, if it's voted up, then it moves forward. If it's voted down, then we discuss what we need to change. That, no, that's just. Go ahead, Daryl. That's just a draft rule to give you all a starting point. 
okay. been my experience whenever we go into a meeting and we don't have some starting point, everything just kind of flounders because nobody really knows. You, you got to have some point to either disagree or agree with and then go from there. That that is not something that y'all have decided. Or this body has said this. This is how it's going to be, unless. So, still totally fluid. Right. I I don't feel like we have to to vote on this today. I I like I, like I said at the beginning of the meeting. At the very worst, we're going to have a pretty productive and in depth discussion, and possibly we can identify where some of the the sticking points are. And I, I think we've done that. Um, and, and that's fine. If that's the best that we can do today, I can live with that tonight. I, I was daring to go a little bit further to see if we could uh, have a some sort of statement that we could say came out of the rules committee meeting. Um, and, it, and it can be pretty cautious. It can be if the if the board uh, today, May 7th, whenever we're having that meeting, if the board were to vote for this rule change, we would want to make sure that these items were addressed. But to be honest, we can phrase it the complete opposite direction. We can say, if the board is going to reject this proposed rule change, we still want to see these items addressed. I, I can go either way on it, but uh, since the, since the like Daryl said, our starting point was the, a proposed change, I wanted to phrase it as if this proposed change was accepted, we still need uh, we still need clarification on the four that Chris suggested, the uh, acknowledgement of the supervisor, liability management, billing management, custody of records, all crucial devil in the details type of items. And then the two that you that you offered, Janie, the, um, uh, the, the 700 hours and the and the minimums. But if, if that's a non-starter with you, I'm I'm really I'm not trying to push you any sort of direction. I am trying to kind of come out with, um, you know, what do we have? We still have we still got 93 people watching this meeting. I would like the 93 people to say I sat through a rules committee meeting today, and I'm not exactly sure what they did. I would want them to say, okay, the rules committee met. They discussed it. They, at the end of it, they all sort of nodded their head and said, this is where we sit today at, at, uh, at 3.30 on two and a half hours into the meeting. Yeah. Uh, first of all, are, are you, is your question straight to me? Where do I sit on it or to all of us? <laughs> yeah, I, I have a bad habit of uh, that, not that's really okay. <laughs> And that's okay. No. So, I mean, I, I'll, I'm, I'm happy to answer that. So um, first of all, I want to say, uh, and, and I don't think the audience, well, I'm quite certain the audience has no idea, but I think most people here know that I have been on this committee about a week, I think, maybe. Welcome, Jada. <laughs> yes. Um, and, and I have really tried to, you know, jump in the deep end, read all that kind of stuff. And so today I would say, and I just flipped my calendar over to see when's May 7th and how much time do we have between then. Um, I, I'm, I'm still germinating. I'm not opposed. I, I, like I said, I want to, I want our associates to come into this field and to be so excited about their opportunity to serve, um, and I would say that any client we serve, uh, you know, falls in a vulnerable population. I, I actually think every one of us is a vulnerable person because we are. Um, I teach my staff and have for years and years. Nobody calls us when life is good. They don't call us when life is bad. Uh, they call us when they're desperate. They need help and, and they just want some help. And that puts us in an amazing position to come into people's lives and to serve them. And, and I just want all of us to be able to look at that and say, that's what I wanna do. I wanna help people and help them when they're at their worst, when they've had a loved one die, when their child is, is you know, in a, in a crisis statement. Or, or situation, whatever. I mean, that's when they call us. And, and when that happens clinically, we got to be able to, to step up to the plate. Yeah, absolutely. We just do. We just one do. Of, I, and 
You're so. reviewing the reviewing the comments um, from the LPC Associates survey that Dr. Allen shared with us. I think the part that I I really took a lot of comfort in was when when associates or when LPCs are asked what is the best part of their job, the the overwhelming and the consistent answer is I love my work, mm -hmm. and that I I really took a lot of um, comfort in that saying um, we. We represent a profession uh, of people that really love what they do, and it's an essential need. Um, what can we do to 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 make it to make it better for them? And and I don't. I, there's not right or wrong positions here that we're discussing today. It's it's just variations of of how do we how how do we have. What rules can we make that make the profession operating at, it, at its best level that, that, we, are, that we have the, the capability to influence? And are we gonna figure that out in 36 minutes? I don't know. <laughs> what, what, what would you have, being the chair of the LPC board, and I think you and I were appointed at the same time. So we've both had a couple of years experience here and, and being over this committee, um, hearing what you've heard, uh, even, and, and I would hope acknowledging concerns from supervisors who clearly state, my concern is they don't know what they don't know yet. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's our role is to help them know that. Um, is it just open it up, give it to everybody, where are you? You know, for, for all of y'all on here, um, I, I view it as the board has jurisdiction to kind of to, to put rules in place that affect your capacity as a therapist. And where, where, I, I, where this issue has sort of given me an opportunity to really evaluate is, do we have authority over how we feel, or, uh, how successful we feel that you will be as a business operator? And I, I'm all for us maintaining um, the rules and the procedures that we have in place that manage the capacity to provide mental health services. But I, I do hesitate when we um, when we exert control over they over their opportunity to be a business owner, and, and I get it's intertwined, and I get that the devil is in the details argument here. And Chris spelled out um, what uh, what kept coming up for me. I, I have questions regarding records. I have questions regarding billing. I have. Uh, um, those, those are ones that we, we really have to drill down into because there is a definition of um, what is specifically covered under professional counseling activity. We have to, we have to really spell that out um, because I, I think it's kind of a gray area right now. And can, um, can someone explain to me that how it would work if, a, if an associate owns their practice but then they go bankrupt. They they so they they are under a, a, a legal that that's a business decision. It's business errors and mismanagement, but it's still a legal protection. So the associates' practice is in bankruptcy. Can they? How will how would they operate as a therapist? I I yeah. don't know. There are still there are still. Um, issues associated with, I, you know, I, speaking from the, the bar standpoint, there's always been controversy that if you declare a personal bankruptcy, that can get you in trouble with your, with your bar license. Cause then they start worrying if you can't manage your own money, how can you manage a client's money? So a bankruptcy on, for a therapist, the question is if you can't, if you can't uh, take care of your business uh, from the financial standpoint, how are you taking care of your of your clients. I, I see that part of it. So. Chris, anything to add?
Yeah, I, I think I'd like to see us kind of move down both sides of the aisle a little bit um, and do uh, draft draft some some uh, more uh, encompassing rules uh, to say that that we're going to do this um, with records, billing, and liability addressed um, a little bit more. Um, uh, in depth than what we have. And then I'd also like to maybe draft as well as something saying, if we're not doing this, um, you know, what are we looking at as far as um, some data to support uh, the, the harm that's caused to the public or might be caused to the public, the, the antitrust concerns, not that these are rules necessarily, but, but just answers to questions that we have. Uh, and, and, uh, um, not to say that we're, we're ever going to regulate how somebody run their business, but um, uh, you know, answering some of those questions about the 1099 and the W-2 and, and how to clear up some of that stuff for them. So maybe they're not rules there, but, but maybe just specific questions that we say, okay, we're not gonna do this. Um, here is a very firm response as to why uh, and why we think that is our authority to do so. Okay. And then we can kind of have that discussion of full board um, once that's sort of drafted and, and kind of figure out which way we want to go. Okay, well, if we're heading down both sides of the aisle, are you comfortable today here in the middle of the rules committee saying which side of the aisle you prefer? Um, well, you know me, uh, I like steak, I'm an American. Uh, yeah, I, I'm all for free enterprise, man. I think people should, should, um, you know, you want to start a business at 18, like, you know, go start a business. Uh, you can start a business younger than 18, really, uh, go for it. I, I'm all for it. Uh, I know firsthand how difficult it is. Um, so good luck. Uh, um, but I know some people want to do that. Some people have that itch. Some people have, have that desire. I don't think there's a reason to stand in their way. Um, but at the same time, you know, as a clinician, I know that there's a lot more that goes into this. Uh, so I, I just want to make sure that that's navigated properly if, if we go down that road. Um, uh, if we choose not to go down that road, then, then I think there's some, some good questions that, that we have to answer. And there seems to be other protections that we need to issue for uh, associates um, and supervisors as well, I think. Jenny? Is there an opportunity to continue to collect data and meet again? What I would do, I would Over offer that I am willing, if we want to, like, like Chris said, go down both sides of the aisle, I can, I can narrow this discussion down. I can write it up and submit it to, okay, staff is starting to give me concerned looks. So tell me how this would look. Um, I can, I can write down the two versions. One, um, we will, we would recommend that the rule change be accepted if the following items are addressed. And I can also draft the, we are against the rule change unless these items are addressed. I can put both of those together with the desire or with the intent of trying to, like one of the outcomes today, narrowing the scope of this discussion to where when we get to, I mean, everyone knows that once we bring this up at full board, it everything is back in play again. But if we, if the rules committee can come and say, we narrowed it down to, to these items, um, that like we had a starting point today, that gives us a starting point when we tackle this again at full board. Chair, Mr. Chair, the, the, the two prong or the two pathway approach, I understand what you're saying there. I guess my question is, are the factors that you're identifying in each one going to be different? Because if they're not, I don't see the utility in using the two, the two path approach. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. I'm, I don't personally, I don't think that the two path of, approach is really necessary because if you if we just did one path if you um if you're against it it's kind of like you are endorsing the other paths anyways yeah um 
I, I'm I'm trying to to give us a a, a definitive type of uh, position on which sides can either add their support or chip away at if they don't yeah. support. Uh, that that is the goal. I don't know if the four of us can agree on a single a single position, even with the stipulations. I don't know if we can do that today. I'm willing to try, but I don't know if we'll be able to. Janie, do you think, and, and I guess, Chris, do you think that, uh, I mean, it doesn't sound like to me uh, that there's really consensus on, or there's unanimity on one way. I really can't tell how some of you are leaning. Some of you I can, and some of you I can't. Um, what I'm trying to figure out is would an additional rules committee meeting actually change anything? If not, it probably oh. just needs to go on to the full board. Y'all figure out what's a clean presentation, like what Chair Albauer just said, what's a clean starting point to give that, that body and move forward. Okay. And uh, I'm with you, Daryl. I like the clean starting point, knowing that it's just going to get messy no matter what. Yeah, when, <laughs> it's going to get bloody no matter what. Yeah, but when you when you bring a, a messy, fuzzy, kind of weird tangential opinion, th that doesn't it, it just gets worse from there. It doesn't. Right. So it, um, it, if if I felt like we were in agreement, I would write the recommendation that rules committee recommends that this rule is changed as proposed, except the following items have to be addressed prior to adoption of the rule change. And I would spell those out. That's how I would write it if I had to pick one of the paths because that it, it, it's not, it, is it endorsing it? It's endorsing it with conditions, but we need it, the, the best option that we can come out with today. It may not be possible, but the best thing that we can come out with today is some sort of of resolution from our discussion today. Would there be any value in having a, a, a working meeting, like a closed meeting where we can kind of go through all the rules and uh, check to make sure that there's no cascading effects through these or that we have them all sorted out and then we can, then we can say, okay, you know, this is the, the proposal here with all the things that we've addressed. Is there any value in that? Uh, there's certainly value in it. Um, th the goal is to to be as transparent as we can, though. Yeah, I just mean a working meeting where we can go through each rule book and 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 you know and just say, okay, this is where that needs to come in. Let's find where this one needs to come in and kind of make sure everything's sorted. Uh, make sure that it's all that we that we have reviewed everything and we can see where all the rules are impacted. Because because I am worried that that impacting records, billing and liability. I mean, that's, it's a large chunk of the rule book when we really get into the details. Well, let's, let's be clear. I feel as though that statement, that position, I feel as though that is TCA's position. I, I, mm -hmm. I interpreted their, their comments and their written position as, okay, yeah, if you guys, if you guys want to do this, here's the important aspects that we want clarified. And I feel like those are, those are the, um, the, the suggestions that they made. It's, it's very in line with, uh, with your sticking points, Dr. Taylor. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Bacon or Jan, uh, feel free to, <laughs> I don't mean to speak for you, but I, I do kind of, I, I was trying I, I did sort of intend on echoing um, your your position. So this is Jan. Um, thank you. Um, I do think that um, the I think that the issues that were identified by Dr. Taylor and Dr. Stubblefield align. Are you Dr. Stubblefield? I am not. <laughs> thank well. you for thinking. <laughs> I am Counselor Stubblefield. <laughs> Um, uh, I can tell by your face, sorry. <laughs> I would rather go up than, than down. 
Um, but anyway, I think that, that those were the issues. We did, we did a very, very informal uh, survey of our membership as well. And those were those pretty much were the issues that came up. We didn't want to share the results of the survey because uh, there were so many comments that were submitted to us that nuanced the results. But the big concerns were there, there seemed to be I don't think that allowing people to bill independently will have any impact whatsoever on counselors' willingness to supervise. Um, we specifically asked that question, and um, you know, 70% of the people who answered our survey said, even if they didn't agree right with it, they said that they would continue to see to, to supervise people. That private practice, that the independent practice is uh, or owning a business is a trickier one, but with the issues that Dr. Taylor and Ms. Stubblefield identified, if those were clearly addressed um, in rules, I, I, I think that uh, people will get comfortable with it. The most important message that I think TCA was trying to submit is that supervisors are also well-trained. They have five years of practice before they can become a supervisor. They are well qualified to make a determination as to whether or not they think an intern, an, an associate is ready to be own a business or ready to uh, build clients. And if they don't think they're ready, then they have the choice not to supervise. And that's their independent decision. But I think if you embrace some of these other standards in the rules, you might make more people more comfortable and more willing to take on more associates. Jan, um, uh, how, how, do you, how do you guys reconcile direct payment um, for services rendered uh, without having a, a business bank account or, or having something filed with the Secretary of State? I, I, I'm not fluent in business matters, although I am the executive director of the association. I probably shouldn't say that so out loud. Um, but um, I, I don't know the. I, I don't. I don't. I don't have the answer to that question. I think you'd have to ask someone uh, and a, a business attorney uh, about that. I'm, I'm not familiar with that. Oh, I, I just so happen to have done a little bit of that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Daryl, from my understanding, it, it, it seems kind of, um, I don't know, what's the word here? Um, uh, 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 diametrically be, opposed? Like you it can't... would be ill-advised. Yeah. I think it's possible you could operate as a sole proprietor, um, but without the protections of, say, a PLLC or right. a PLLP you're then going to be individual, you know, you expose yourself to a little bit more individual liability. And of course, you're yeah, always- Gerald, the, the phrase sole proprietor gives lawyers uh, heart attacks. Um, yes, exactly. That. That's yeah, the yeah. law school and, after the uh, rule against perpetuities. And you would, you would <laughs> automatically become a sole proprietor at the end of the year when you file your taxes. Like you, you, you just become one. It yeah. just happens. So and you get that, bumped into that other category there. So. That's what you Pay are by taxes. default. Yeah, yeah, you are a sole proprietor unless you form another entity and operate under that. And that therein, that's where the problem lies is then if you're expecting them to manage their business uh, in, in, a, in a wise way, and yet you're saying, well, you can't form this business, you know, we, we're only going to allow you to do this as a sole proprietor, you're setting them up in a very dangerous situation. So you're not doing them a favor, but really by saying, well, we'll let you do direct billing, um, but you know everything's going to come in under your name, your social security number, or your DBA, whatever it is you're doing business as, uh, assumed as. It, it, I don't think if they went to an attorney, no, I don't know of an attorney who would go, yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't say that, but anyway. Yeah. And I, I actually believe Dr. Allen brought up the point that mm -hmm. um, it's not either or, it, it's both and or neither nor. Like they get to direct bill and own a practice or they don't get to direct bill nor own a practice. I think those are the two roads we're looking at. I'd agree. Well, I mean, that, that, that's Dr. Allen's proposal. I mean, we don't, we don't have to, you know, we're not 
stuck in that box, but yeah. But I'm just saying to say you can direct bill, but you can't own a private practice is, is to Daryl's point. Yeah, that, I agree. I mean, I, I think we would be crippling folks on, on the, on what they're doing. So. I agree. I, I see, I see how it would resolve the, the, you know, the splits or the, the rev, rev share is really what it is. Um, um, issue because I'm the money's going directly into my bank account, but but unless that's that account is in a business entity, I think it's extremely dangerous. Yeah. Um, so Jan, do you mind coming back for a minute? Welcome back, Jeff. Yes, sir. Uh, assuming that that they have to be tied together. Yes, sir. How how would TCA respond again, to them I, tied together? So again, I think um, TCA doesn't want to make decisions for LPC supervisors. We think they're qualified to make those decisions themselves. What we have heard is that if there is more detail um, in the rules, more specificity in the rules. Uh, you know, uh, I think a big issue in, in, in along the lines of protecting the public, I think we've mentioned this in our comments, yeah. so I don't, I don't, I'm trying not to be redundant, but you know, currently right now your rules say that the name and number of the supervisor has to be on an LBC associate's documents. Our concern is that in this change of circumstance where they would be having their own business or um, and, and working independently with the client that those documents sh you should require more specificity in the document so that because the uh, you know i talked about the, to daryl about this when we were at the capitol the other day you know i could be jan freeze lpc associate on the top of my of my billing form Right. And on the bottom, even in the same font, says Daryl Stinks, LBC supervisor, and his number. If I'm a consumer, I might just think we're business partners that, you know, and not really understand. So I think intake forms, billing forms, you know, to, to require some more specificity to inform the public, because then the public can make a choice. Supervisor can make a choice, public can make a choice. And you have done, in our view, you have done your due diligence in terms of protecting the public. Um, I think the requiring, getting really pristine on what's counseling practice and what's business practice, right? I think our, we identified a point where we saw that there was a conflict between in knowing that those were just draft rules. There was a conflict that could create confusion. I think if you, I, I think the, the point about creating a guidance document can't tell you how many calls I get from people who you would think would be able to understand, but they don't understand. Okay, they don't always understand the rules and they don't understand the process. So giving a guidance document, having specificity on your intake forms, your billing forms, making clear distinctions, all the things that Dr. Taylor said. And then the other big concern, which goes to the point that Ms. Stubblefield made, is taking a really hard look at what, what, what should that practicum look like before they are, at, and, and should there be some consistency? Because, you know, Texas has so many counseling programs and there's such a huge difference between what you get if you go to a KCREP program and what you get if you don't go to a KCREP program. And if you could get some consistency there, right? So that whether you go to a KCREP program or whether you go to a non-KCREP program, you're going to come out of your practicum experience with the same number of hours uh, supervised in a setting where you have an LBC supervisor who, I mean, I was a little stunned to hear the psychologist, and with all due respect, if this person is still on there, stunned to hear that a psychologist <clears throat> is providing supervision to, to an LBC, even in a practicum setting. So I think, I really do think you could do this. The, the critical issue is getting into the, is, is the devil in the detail of getting things laid out correctly, because if you don't, 
your staff is going to be inundated with calls, TCA is going to be inundated with calls, and you may end up facing some complaints, whether they're jurisdictional, whether they're valid or not. You could, you know, you could end up really building up that work pile. But if you take the time, because you could take the time, there's a big difference in the training for an LPC today than there was when these rules were initially adopted, right? We've gone from 36 hour to 48 hour to 60 hours, right? You've gone from 2000 hours of supervision to 3000 hours. There's a huge difference. So you can acknowledge that, but pay attention to the details of it so that when it's launched, everybody knows exactly what it is. Thanks, Jana. I appreciate that. Um, that's kind of my point, though, is, is that I'm kind of trying to make here is that, is that it's not as simple as flipping a switch and saying, OK, we can now have associates opening their own practices. I think uh, uh, as we're kind of highlighting, there's a slew of rules that need to be uh, reviewed and addressed. And, and if we have to get into the educational side of it, I mean, that's even more. Uh, and, and, you know, I'm always worried of, of how much more we continue to put on our on our schools uh, before they're before we've just sort of said, hey, you need to be in school for four years to become a therapist, you know? You might as well just go be a doctor uh, or a psychologist. Hey, Dr. Taylor, just yeah. real quick. Uh, Janie, I know, I know you've got a four o'clock. Uh, so um, how, how quickly do, we, do, we, do you need to leave? Go. Uh, in nine minutes. In nine minutes, okay. Um, I just we would still have a quorum here if you need. Well, technically, we still have two agenda items to go. Oh, uh, Dr. Taylor, back to you. Um, Y'all, I, I don't yes. think that in nine minutes here, we can draft a, a definitive statement for what the rules committee has a, agreed on to recommend today. However, Correct. Patrick, Daryl, Christina, um, shut me down here if, if, I, if you have to. Can I draft the... Uh, like Dr. Taylor called it, the, the two pathways. Can I draft those and circulate them to our committee? Will that be a walking quorum? No. Okay. No. Okay. Yeah. Because uh, someone's yeah. been reading the news. We don't want to get arrested, Daryl. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, okay, I can told I, you. There's I, not, bail money is not in our budget. I'm just going to tell you all that right now. <laughs> okay. Can, Probably not covered in my liability insurance either. <laughs> Okay, can uh, can that be the, the the product of today? Is that I will draft the, the two pathways, the accept the rules um, under the following strict stipulations, or uh, turn or accept the rule change under the, the the suggested stipulations from Dr. Taylor and Ms. Stubblefield, or uh, we will decline the rules. However, this is what these are the aspects that we are concerned about and that we do want to address. Is, can I, is, is that acceptable? That, that is agreeable. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I would add that uh, we, we are going to have to do some kind of inclusive rule review to, to, agree. Really, to really get this through if that's what we're going to do. So we have, we have seven minutes left with, with Ms. So let's get going. Let's get uh, going. What, what is the, um, Procedurally, what are, are the requirements that we need to follow if this is if this is what we want to have come out of out of this meeting? Is that directed at, at us, Chair? I think Daryl, that's a Daryl question. Yeah, you're not you're not bound by any hard and fast procedures. It's whatever procedure you set. Uh, right. If you if you want to circulate that amongst the committee members and get their okay on it. Uh, just by email, that's fine. And then you take it, okay. whether it be to another rules committee meeting or the board, that's fine. And Daryl, can we have dialogue back and forth? Like if we like one part, but we want other part. I think that was Dr. Taylor's working committee idea. Yeah, no, that, that's not what, what, what I was getting at, but yeah. Okay, Christina? But I think you need to send it to me and I compile yeah. your responses and then I can send that out to the committee. Okay. So we're not emailing directly back and forth to each other. A, a simple way to handle that may be for Christina to simply upload the Word doc in her shared folder, give you all access to it. You can edit it in a one common place. 
and then you don't have emails flying back and forth like bunt cakes at Christmas. Um, makes it a little easier on y'all. Okay. Okay. Bunt cake uh, or buntinis for Brenda's birthday, right? Any of the, any of the three of y'all, do you have any? Do you have any um, strong opinion that we shouldn't go with the 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 two options that we should just pick one of them? And can you clarify that? Like both ability to receive direct payment and own a practice or not receive payment and not own a practice. Is that what you mean by both? What I'm trying to identify is the, the key issues that would have to be addressed if the rules committee feels like we can endorse the rule change that we would allow um, independent practice and direct billing. Those identifying those key issues based on today's discussion, mm -hmm. but also at the same time saying, here's our other option. And that's if we were to say no, and that we go, we maintain the status quo on our rules. Uh, and, and these are the reasons why we are saying no. And oh, so okay. if you want to change our minds, here's the reasons that we address are the other reasons that, that you're going to have to address if you want to change our minds. So while we don't, while we're not coming out of today with a, having chosen a side, uh, I feel like we have been successful in narrowing the scope of the debate. And that was, that was an outcome that I was willing to accept from today. Yay. Anybody else? Anybody else want to add? Janie, I, I think my clock, we've got you for four, uh, three more minutes. Yeah. So. Okay, any any last thoughts? I know that we did have agenda item four, which is um, items for future consideration. We kind of just did that. I have an item to add, and, and, and this is to for looking at opportunities for the state of Texas to address the mental health crisis we're in. Uh -huh. Much like Dr. Taylor said, uh, he had a client move to North Dakota, I think you said, and you called that board and said, hey, how do we do that? Um, I've also had a very similar thing with another state, and um, it, was, it was very easy for me to be able to get an endorsement from that state to be able to do, provide telehealth, is maybe we need to have some rules in place for how if, if clinicians from other states um, have clients that, you know, are jurisdictionally in Texas, how do we then, um, regulate? I don't know if, I don't know what the right word is, Daryl, Daryl, you can correct me if you need to, but how do we, uh, incorporate, uh, a larger pool of professionals to be able to, again, begin to address the mental health crisis that we all know exists? A, a lot of your ability to respond to that type of a, a demand it, it depends upon gubernatorial disaster declarations. And then I have to request suspension of certain rules or statutes for you guys, which right now the governor's not granting that. You, you don't really have, you don't have a, a statutory license. Like psychology, for example, they have a true temporary license that's designed for that type of thing. Mm -hmm. The other boards do not. Um, what y'all call a temporary license actually serves as right now the associate license. It's not a true temporary license. It's kind of a misnomer in the statute. Um, so you, you've got an issue there. Uh, and, and we can't just by rule make up, you know, we can't by rule waive our own statutory licensing requirements. Mm. I, I don't know that, yeah, my idea wouldn't, was not to waive any of that. Um, so mine, I actually, mine happens to be the state of Florida and they have a licensure path and then they have a path to essentially, like if your client moves to their state and, and they still want you and ABCD, how mm -hmm. all that works is then they have a path to, um, you have to go through their application. It, it's a different path than gotcha. licensure. I am not gotcha. licensed in Florida, but I have a, a certification. I don't know what their term is, but I have an endorsement to be able to provide telehealth only. It's very specific. I cannot open a practice. I have to have blah, 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 blah. You, I don't know if that'll address some of our mental health crisis. You, statutorily, you have to have a license to practice in Texas. Now, the, the one okay. thing that is bubbling in the works and I know TCA is working on this. 
is the compact the licensure compact that will solve a lot of y'all's problems there plus this house bill 3626 i think i got that right 3626 uh that we just went over and uh, dealt with the other day that's that's going to solve some of those problems as well because that creates an expedited pathway to licensure for proven independent practitioners in other jurisdictions you got a couple of things in the works unfortunately what the things you need are going to require statutory changes so we're, we're kind of limited there so not an agenda item never mind uh, chair halbar it, it was still a, a worthwhile uh, suggestion it's four o'clock i know you need to go i do um any any last second are, are we just gonna if Janie's gone, I would prefer to wrap up the meeting. Uh, I know I've got some homework. I will get that to Christina. Uh, if does anybody have anything right real quick to add, or are we good? Guys, thank you. Uh, I'm grateful for for everybody's hard work on this. Uh, everybody that submitted comments or made public comments. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry that they had to be so short. I just knew we had a, a lengthy discussion ahead of us. Um, this is going to continue, obviously, but uh, it's a process. And this was just uh, another item that uh, we, we did make some progress on. Thank you. Um, I appreciate it. Uh, I hope to see everybody in person someday soon. But until then, uh, take care. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Meetings adjourned.